Hi, everybody. Welcome to the New York, NorCal, and SoCal NetSuite user group. My name is Michelle Cronley, and I will be your host along with Craig Cook. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We have got just an absolute jam-packed schedule today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to our keynote conversation with Jay Scott uh, in the middle of our presentation today. And I'm just gonna take this opportunity, the first opportunity to shout out our fundraising challenge. Help us raise money for the fight against childhood cancer. More details are coming up very soon, just a couple slides away, uh, but we're gonna dive in and start to look at our agenda for today. All right. First up, we have our CPE credit session with Tim Chobel and Karen Reyes that will be discussing shared vendor bills and sweet promotion. Then following the CPE session, we have a special treat for all of you today. We have Evan Goldberg, founder and EVP of Oracle NetSuite, joining us along with Gavin Davidson, speaking a little bit about NetSuite and what's to come in the future. Following Evan and Gavin, we have Jay Scott from Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation that will be participating in a fireside chat with our CMO, Craig Cook. Then after Jay Scott, we have Robert from Starbucks speaking about how he has used NetSuite to move to the cloud and how it has helped him keep up during the COVID pandemic. Then last but not least, we have Adam Porter from Nolan Business Solutions speaking about Suite Analytics. Excellent, jam-packed schedule today. Quick housekeeping note, um, with your Zoom interface, you're gonna see a couple of little buttons on the bottom. We've got the chat, the raise hand, the Q&A. Um, please use the Q&A interface for all of your direct questions to either our panelists, our moderators, or um, in the Q&A session that we'll have at the end today. The chat button is more for interacting with us in other ways, not necessarily questions. Um, and we may ask uh, down the line a couple of uh, chat responses from you uh, as part of our participation today. Um, so if you raise your hand, you can lower your hand. There's the Q&A button. It's just a simple interface. Type your questions and comments right in there, and we will get to all of them. All right. Absolutely. Just a reminder to all of you attending today, we will be sending all presentations, recording, and slides within one to two weeks of the event. So we do have a few bit of edits, so just bear with us for those one to two weeks, but we promise you, you will have the recording and slides in your inbox. Also, we're always looking for more volunteers, more presenters, more sponsors. If you are interested in becoming more involved, just send a chat to any of the panelists and we will help you get involved. And also, while we may not be meeting in person due to the pandemic, we're always available via our LinkedIn groups. So in a few minutes, I'll be posting the links to our New York, NorCal, and SoCal LinkedIn groups. And we would love for you to join us to keep the conversation going after today. Excellent. Uh, additionally, I just launched the first poll uh, of the day. Now, polling we're doing for a number of reasons. Number one, we've got CPE session today. And for a CPE session, polling is required. So if you are a CPE, and I'll remind you about this later, please be sure uh, to answer the polling questions so that you can get credit for your course uh, today. Um, that said, we're also really interested in what you guys have to say about uh, our user group and about NetSuite. Um, so there's going to be questions dispersed throughout the day. Um, everybody will have a couple of minutes each to, uh, to answer the polling. Um, so give us some feedback. Let us know what's going on. All right. So here's the big, the big theme for our user group this week. So as many of you know, um, the shift to virtual uh, means that we don't necessarily have expenses. Um, the expenses of renting our venues and do, providing catering and travel um, to make sure that these user groups uh, happen in person. Um, but we still got sponsors and you'll hear from them today. So, you know, we said to ourselves, what, what can we do with the funds? And Michelle came up with a great idea. She said, let's donate the funds to a charity. And we were going to do this um, you know, with any charity that we decided to pick. And, and then Michelle thought a little bit more and she said, wait a minute, there are some, some great nonprofit organizations that are involved with NetSuite. And why don't we highlight a NetSuite user uh, and somebody who would pop, be, be a part of the user group. Uh, so we identified Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. I think Michelle saw 
Jay Scott, the founder, speak at Sweet World uh, maybe two years ago, three years ago, and uh, was very impressed with his presentation. And we got in touch with him, and he said he'd be he'd be happy to uh, to take the donation. Um, and then we pushed it even further, and he said, "Hey Jay, why don't you give a presentation to our user group and tell them about what you've been doing with NetSuite?" And he said, "Awesome!" So, to this quarter, we have themed our entire user group around our involvement with Alex's Lemonade Sand Foundation. Um, it is a truly amazing organization, which you're going to hear about a little bit later today uh, during Jay Scott's uh, keynote. But I did want to point out to everybody that we have a challenge uh, grant going on right now. And if you look in the chat panel, Michelle just put the link to the Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation page for the uh, uh, New York SoCal and NorCal NetSuite user groups. This is a page specifically dedicated to us. We're trying to raise money. And every dollar that we raise today is gonna to be matched by your user groups. So we're doing it as a challenge grant um, and up to $6,000. So today we are trying to raise $12,000 for Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation to fight childhood cancer um, and to support one of our great nonprofit NetSuite users um, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that today, and we're going to keep reminding you, and we're going to check in on that website from time to time, uh, live on our session today. Um, so please, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. COVID-19 is a challenge. It ain't great, um, but we're going to take this opportunity to do something good since we can't be with you in person. So Michelle and I are going to take, I'm doing tea with lemon and honey, and Michelle's doing lemonade, and Cheers to Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, and we hope that you all participate with us. If everybody gives just $5 who's on, on, on the call today, we're going to reach uh, some of our goals, and hopefully we get a little bit of corporate sponsorship as well. So cheers to that. And, you haven't, if, and if you haven't heard the story of Alex and how she began the Lemonade Stands as just a little four or five-year-old, you will hear today from Jay, and it's a remarkable story, and we hope you enjoy this fascinating keynote we have in store for you. Excellent, excellent. All right, let me end that poll. There's so many things going on today. Thank you for your participation in the opening poll. Quick note to all of our CPE members on the call today. Remember that you must vote in at least three of the polls and watch for the 50 minutes of the CPE session to receive your credit. Uh, the Zoom webinar platform reports back on your attentiveness and gives us an audit trail. Um, and we have to be very serious about it. So if you, if you don't follow the rules, we can't give out the certificate. Um, and we really want you to get that credit. Um, so vote in those three polls, watch for 15 minutes, and your course certificates will be delivered after our audit review. It does take some time to go through all of the reports and the validation, so please uh, bear with us and we'll get those certificates out to you. And just a little note, please make sure you do register through our CPE registration. I just posted the link in the chat. If you just registered via the normal user group events, we won't know that you need CPE credit. So just make sure you register via that link so we can get you your certificates. Absolutely. Michelle, how about you thank our sponsors for yes. today? Speaking of our, our, you know, those sponsorship dollars going to a good cause, why don't we say thanks? Yes, as always, the sponsors make all of our user groups happen. They make the food great. And then right now they're helping us fight childhood cancer. So a big shout out to business solution partners, Avalara, Bill.com, DSI Global, Tapalti, and Nolan Business Solutions. Thank you much. Thank you all, everyone, for all of your help. Thank you guys so much. You know, normally you, your sponsorship dollars help run and administrate uh, the user groups and, and make sure that we can hold those live events. And we're really happy that you continued to sponsor us and we were able to take those dollars and convert them into a donation. Um, so we really appreciate it. All right, first up, uh, we've got Mitchell Yee from Bill.com just going to uh, hop on board. Hey, Mitchell, how's it going? Good. Thank you for the introduction, Craig. Really appreciate it. And today we're just talking a little bit about Bill.com as a leader in financial uh, process automation. And really, Bill.com started 14 years ago, really focusing on, on AP for the business, anywhere from small to medium businesses. Renee Lassert is a serial entrepreneur whose parents and grandparents were entrepreneurs. He saw firsthand how simplifying and automating payments could help a business adapt to change business conditions. Our powerful AP automation solution for the mid-market is based on the principles of simplicity and ease of use. In addition to over 70% of the top U.S. accounting firms using Bill.com with their clients, Bill.com is a preferred provider of digital payment solutions 
for CPA.com, the technology arm of AICPA. Bill.com partners with leading U.S. financial institutions. Our customers approve more than 2.4 million bills per month. Bill.com international payments supports 137 countries and 106 currencies. Bill.com has compliances for money transmitted license in all 50 states. And Bill.com is now a publicly traded company listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Bill.com really takes the complexity out of a very manual labor-based process and turns it into four simple automated state steps. We want to make this as easy as possible. When our route started 14 years ago with the SMB market, we wanted to make it as simple and easy to connect and do business. So with Bill.com, we use a true artificial intelligence to help you in a single repository capture all invoices via email, upload, drag and drop, and these captured images are automatically read by IVA, our inbox virtual assistant. It's a true artificial intelligence that can capture invoices in real time and code them. Who doesn't want to eliminate that manual process at this time? It also allows for the flexibility and adaptable finance organization as these current times and situations are with living or working from home. Bill.com also can easily approve bills from anywhere. Uh, you can do it from your mobile phone, you can do it from your computer, you can be on the golf course, you can you know, be outside on your patio, you can create bills, approve bills, all within our mobile application, and including paying. The approvals is easy, it's almost automatic. Bills are entered and approvers get notified, reminders are sent out, they can approve it digitally, it makes it easy to stay on top of cash flow, and there's no need to set predetermined approvers. With Bill.com's smart data, the approvers are remembered for routing, so there's no need to enter them in or predetermined, and it also provides you the flexibility of switching approvers when needed, or if anyone's on vacation or out, you can easily change them right there within the interface. Once bills are approved, the vendors need to be paid. And within Bill.com, you can make payments in a single platform, all by ACH, international wires, virtual card, and checks. You control when the vendors are going to get paid and how the vendors are going to get paid. We have everything you need to make all the payments in one platform. The final step, which is really a time saver and a game changer, is Bill.com handles the reconciliation in your accounting software. All of this information syncs to the GL account, to your cash account, from the creation of the bills, to the applied payments, adjustments, vendors and customers information. So you don't have to transfer the data manually, do double entry, it keeps it all in one repository area and syncs it all back to your NetSuite accounting software to keep that up to date as well. To learn more, you can sign up for a 30 minute live product tour or a custom one-on-one. -on -one. We can get you set up on bill.com in two hours or less. It's very simplistic and easy, and that's the part, whole part of being able to simplify the process of AP efficiency. Bill.com users save on average 36 days annually, and this is something that with complex workflows can save a lot of time, especially in today's current status. So if you need anything, please do visit our website. We can do a custom one-on-one -on -one demo. You can sign up for a live product tour and a no-risk trial. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, Mitch, thanks so much. Um, Bill.com is a great uh, product. Uh, I've worked with it. And uh, we actually, uh, so if you want to learn more, go to Bill.com. But we also recently did a video uh, with Mitch, a webinar uh, specifically focused in on the Bill.com solution. And that's hosted at the BSP uh, YouTube page. Um, so if you want to check that out, check out YouTube and uh, uh, Business Solution Partners on YouTube, and you can see a great video there. All right, thanks, Mitch. Um, we're going to move forward into our first CPE session of the day. Uh, it's uh, a dual session. So for the CPE credits, you, you, you've got to sit through 
uh, both uh, Karen and Tim's presentation. Um, although uh, sit through is probably not the right word because these are awesome presentations on uh, shared vendor bills and suite promotions. And we think you're gonna learn a lot. Um, so let me launch our opening CPE poll. Um, so everybody can get credit. And I am going to hand the baton over to Karen Reyes from Business Solution Partners for her session on sweet promotions before we uh, hand it over to Tim for his session on shared vendor bills. Karen, you with us? Yes. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Take it so, away. Thanks, Greg. Hello, um, like Craig introduced, I'm Karen Reyes and I work for Business Solution Partners as a NetSuite implementation consultant. And today I will discuss and demonstrate NetSuite's Suite Promotions feature. Uh, first, let's take a look at the different advantages and types of using Suite Promotions. Okay, so Suite Promotions offer all these advantages. Stackable promotions, suite promotions allow you to apply multiple promotions to one transaction, thereby offering better discounts to your customers. For auto-apply promotions, suite promotions automatically apply multiple eligible promotions at the point of sale, so you do not need to enter the promotions manually. Best offer, suite promotions ensure that when multiple eligible promotions are applied to a transaction the customer gets the best offer available or the largest discount possible uh, automatically add free gift to the transaction suite promotions allow you to create a promotion that automatically adds a free gift to an eligible transaction any inventory item can be offered or added as a free gift customer specific promotions uh, suite promotions allow you to create promotions for specific customers. Qualifying item quantity, suite promotions allow you to specify how many items a customer needs to buy for them to be eligible for the discount provided by a suite promotion. And for free shipping eligibility, suite promotions allow you to create shipping promotions that give customers free shipping for their transactions using a specified shipping method. Uh, moreover, suite promotions allow you to create these different promotion types, item promotion, fixed price item promotion, order promotion, shipping promotion, and free gift promotion. Item promotion um, allows you to give customers percentage or currency amount discounts on specific items in a transaction. It may be a percentage or amount of an item or items. It may be a percentage or amount of an item or of items if uh, certain order criteria are met. It can be an item specific promotional discount for a segment of customers or a promotional discount of an item or item for a segment of customers if certain order criteria are met. Fixed price item promotion allows you to create promotions that offers items at a fixed promotional or discounted price. It may be uh, a promotion where an item or items are available at a fixed price or an item or items are available at a fixed price if certain order criteria are met. It can also be an item specific promotional discount for a segment of customers or a promotion wherein an item or items are available at a fixed price during a specified period. We also have order promotion that gives percentage or currency discounts applied to the order total. It could be a percentage or amount of an order or a percentage or amount of if certain order criteria are met. It can be an order specific promotional discount for a segment of customers or a promotional discount of items for a segment of customers if certain order criteria are met. The fourth sweet promotion type would be the shipping promotion, which allows you to give free shipping to customers using a specified shipping method. Um, it can be item based or order level. Item base is wherein you are providing free shipping when customers buy a specific item or items. Order level is wherein you are providing free shipping on orders with or without spend conditions. Just to note that you cannot offer a flat rate or percentage discount on shipping. The last sweet promotion type is the free gift promotion, wherein you're able to give free item to customers and that item is automatically added to the order if that transaction is eligible. It could be an item is available for free with any order, 
an item is available for free if certain order criteria are met, a free item is given away to a segment of customers, and an item is given away for free during a specified period. Okay, so we have briefly discussed the advantages and types of sweet promotions. Now, what we will do is we will walk through the creation of a sample item promotion, which is a buy one, get one free promotion. And along the way, we will discuss the different fields in a promotion record. After that, we will take a look at the other promotions that I created in advance, and we will then create sales orders to see how these promotions will apply. So let's start. I'm going to switch to my NetSuite screen. Okay. Okay, so the Sweet Promotions feature is already enabled, so we can just go ahead and create that promotion. Okay, I'm going to Lists, Marketing, Promotions, New. So in this page, you can see the different promotion types that you can create when the Sweet Promotions feature is enabled. I'm just going to select Item Promotion here. Okay. Um, we will use uh, luggage as the item for all the promotions. So for this one, this is a buy one, get one free. So I'm going to call it, oops, I want green. Okay. And we will just copy it over to the description field. Start date is the date when the promotion can be first applied to the transaction. So I'll just select August 1st. End date is the date when the promotion can no longer be applied to the transaction. So let's just say August 31st. Combination with other promotions. So you just need to select a combination option here. Combinable promotion means that you're able to combine this promotion with other eligible promotions on a transaction. Exclusive promotion means this promotion cannot be combined with other eligible promotions on a transaction. Item line exclusive promotion means this promotion cannot be combined with other eligible promotions for the same item on the transaction. Uh, we'll just leave it at combinable promotion. This promotion can be automatically applied. So if you want this promotion to be automatically applied to eligible transactions, just go ahead and click the box, which we want to do. So I'll do it. Discount item for accounting would be the discount item that will be impacted by this promotion's uh, discount. I'm going to select sales discount, okay. What the customer needs to buy. So you choose what the customer needs to buy to be eligible for the discount provided by the promotion. They could do buy anything, which means that this promotion is available to all eligible customers when they add any item to the transaction or spend the minimum order amount or buy specific items. This means that this promotion is available to all eligible customers only when the transaction meets the eligibility criteria. You can choose from either or minimum order amount or specific items. For minimum order amount, the customer must spend a minimum amount to be eligible for the promotion. In this demo account, the multiple currencies feature is enabled, so you can see all the different currencies listed here. You just need to input the minimum order amount in this field. If you select specific items, you need to select the item or items that the customer must buy to be eligible for this promotion. So we want the customer to purchase a luggage, so we will select that from this uh, drop-down field. Okay. And then, if you have multiple items, um, you can also create a save search and select that save search from this drop down. Item quantity, enter how many units of each selected item that the customer has to buy to get the discount provided by this promotion. So we leave it at one. Repeat discount incrementally means um, to repeat the discount of the transaction, every time the customer adds the number of items in this item quantity field, um, just go ahead and check this box. What the customer will get. So discount rate will be the discount rate for the promotion. Um, select percentage, of course, if the rate is a percentage and flat if it's going to be a flat discount. So since this is a buy one, get one promotion, we'll just enter 100 here and leave it at percentage. From items list, 
uh, what's the item that will be discounted by the promotion? So that will be a luggage because it's a buy one, get one free promotion. Again, if you have a save search, you can um, select the save search here. Apply discount to. Um, so these options are available depending on the promotion type. Each discountable item means that each eligible item in the transaction will be discounted. Cheapest discountable item means the cheapest eligible item in the transaction will be discounted. And most expensive discountable item in the transaction will be discounted. So we'll select cheapest discountable item here. Coupon code subtab. So if the promotion codes feature is enabled, you'll see that uh, subtab in the promotion record. Uh, you just need to choose how many times the coupon codes can be used and the corresponding coupon codes to use. So you have two options, multiple uses. If you select multiple uses, you would need to enter the code in the coupon code field. If you select single use, you can either import the codes or have NetSuite generate the, uh, generate the code for you based on the code pattern that you enter. Um, here, we'll just uh, leave it at multiple uses and I say, uh, okay, okay. Audience, um, if you want this promotion to be applicable to all customers, just leave it at everyone. But if you'd like only selected customers to be able to use the promotions, uh, select specific customer and then select um, or filter the results from here. We'll leave it at everyone. Sales channels, um, you can select uh, where this promotion would apply to if you want this to be applied to all promotions or specific locations only. If you have the website option or sweet commerce available, you can see another option here. It would say all locations and websites, specific locations, and a third option for specific websites. Uh, usage limits, um, if the Coupon code is a multiple use coupon code. You would see this field here. Um, you need to select how many times a customer can avail of the promotion that has a multiple use coupon code. A limited amount of times means there are no restrictions on how many times customer can use the promotion. And this is the default behavior. Uh, one time only means uh, you are going to limit the usage of the promotion to one time only per customer. Okay, so I think we're good here. Let me just review before we save. Okay, save. Okay, uh, let me go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, so for this demo, we will be testing three different suite promotions. Um, the get $75 off on orders for luggage, buy a luggage and get $150 off an additional luggage, and luggage, buy one, get one free. Um, I have a note here that each luggage costs $300. All of these promotions are combinable promotions and they can also be automatically applied to eligible transactions. Uh, so what we're going to do next is we'll be entering a sales order to see what happens. So let me again switch to NetSuite. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. It's my favorite customer. Okay, then let's add luggage. Okay, so when we added one luggage to the sales order, we can see that one promotion was automatically applied. To see more information about the applied promotions, we can just click on the promotion sub tab in the sales order. So you can see get the get $75 off on orders for luggage was applied. Okay, and I want to show you this one. 
So when all the promotions are combinable, we will get a $75 discount if we buy one luggage. The other two promotions do not apply because they require more than one luggage to be bought. Okay. What happens if we change the quantity to two? So let me get out of this screen again. And then I'll just update the quantity to two. Okay, so if we change the quantity to two, we can see that all the promotions are automatically applied. And we can see that in the promotion sub tab. And let's take a look at the next table. Okay, so when all the promotions are combinable, we will get a $600 discount from a $600 order if we buy two luggage. And we saw how the promotions are applied to a transaction when they are all combinable. So now what we'll do is we will change one of the promotions to be an item line exclusive promotion. This means that that promotion cannot be combined with other eligible promotions for the same item on a transaction. We'll update this uh, promotion to get $75 off on orders for luggage to be an item line exclusive promotion and then we'll enter new sales orders. Okay. So let's go back to NetSuite. Um, let me refresh this one. Get $75 off. Okay, item line exclusive. Okay, new sales order. Same customer. Okay, one luggage. Okay, so upon adding one quantity of luggage to a sales order, we can see uh, that the discount was applied. And in the promotion sub tab, we can see that the item line exclusive promotion was still automatically applied, but the other promotions were not. Um, so let's take a look at the next table. Okay, so for a $300 order, with uh, promotions that are combinable and item line exclusive, we will still get a $75 discount. But let's update the quantity to two to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can see that there are still promotions that were automatically applied. And going to the promotion sub tab, we can see that the item line exclusive promotion was not applied. This is because the item line exclusive promotion cannot be applied along with the other promotions for the same item. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at the table again. Okay, for a transaction which uh, has combinable and item line exclusive promotions, if we purchase two quantity, uh, we will be getting a $450 discount from a $600 order. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we will change one of the promotions to be an exclusive promotion, meaning it cannot be combined with other eligible promotions on a transaction. So let's go ahead and update the buy one get one free promotion that we just created earlier okay exclusive okay and then let's enter a new sales order Okay, so when we added one, uh, one quantity of luggage to a sales order, we are still getting a $75 discount from a $300 order. The same item line exclusive promotion was still automatically applied. So let's just check the table. 
Okay, so for a transaction which has a combinable item line exclusive and exclusive promotions, uh, if we purchase one quantity, we are getting a $75 discount from a $300 order. Okay, and what happens if we change the quantity to two? So let me go back to NetSuite. And I'll just uh, give sure. you a five minute warning. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Okay, so when we updated the quantity to two, we can see that only one of the promotions was automatically applied. The promotion that was applied is the exclusive promotion that cannot be combined with other promotions in a transaction. And let's just take a look at the table. Okay, so for a transaction that has combinable item line exclusive and exclusive uh, promotions, if we purchase two of uh, two quantity of the luggage, we will get a three hundred dollar discount from a six hundred dollar order. Um, this is actually it for my presentation. I hope that this is helpful for you and that you learned something from me regarding how the promotions work and the importance of setting them up correctly so you can achieve the desired results for yourself and for your customers. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Karen, thanks so much. Thank uh, you. Awesome, awesome. Looking forward to uh, uh, getting a 50% discount. Buy one, get one free on some luggage <laughs> in the near future. <laughs> yes. All right, CPEs, stick around. That's not the end of this session. We've got Tim Schobel coming up, and we're going to dive right into a conversation about shared vendor bills. Tim, how's it going? There we go. Hey, can you hear me how's now? How's it going? We can hear you now. There we go. Perfect. So, yeah, this is going to be a conversation about shared vendor bill, a little overview, and hopefully a demo if we have some time at the end. So, quick uh, agenda here. We'll just introduce the concept of shared vendor bills and what uh, this bundle does. Then we'll talk about installing and configuring um, NetSuite to support the bundle. And before get, you know, discussing a little bit about the actual use of shared vendor bills and uh, hopefully uh, jumping into a demo in NetSuite. Okay. So what is shared vendor bill? Uh, so I'll just start by explaining what Suite Solutions are. Um, they're pre-built offerings. Uh, meaning that they're designed and developed to accelerate the delivery of uh, custom functionality to customer accounts. It's designed by NetSuite. Uh, and they're also non-managed, meaning that the, uh, you know, they're configurable uh, to your business requirements. So the shared vendor bill itself uh, is a solution that enables you to specify the distribution of expenses and taxes from vendor bills across subsidiaries, which would be an inter-company distribution or uh, across segments within a subsidiary, which would be an intra-company distribution. And these distributions can be percentage-based or amount-based. So uh, really, uh, customers that might have a lot of you know, intercompany company buildbacks uh, could stand to benefit from this suite app. So I'll discuss a little bit about in the installation process here. Uh, there are certain prerequisite features that you should enable before installing the bundle. Um, if you are using a one world account or you have multiple currencies, uh, you'll have to make sure that that feature is enabled, especially if you're doing some sort of a intercompany distribution uh, for subsidiaries that might be transacting in different currencies. Also, you want to enable client suite scripts, server suite scripts, suite flow, custom records, and custom segments. Those are typically enabled uh, when your account is initially configured anyway. And also, automated intercompany management is uh, required for um, any intercompany distributions. And uh, note there is that to use automated intercompany management, uh, you'll have to set up an elimination subsidiary. Okay. There are also certain uh, role permissions you would need to be able to install the bundle. Uh, either you would have to be installing the bundle from the administrator role, or you need to have the sweep bundler permission added to your role. Then you can install the uh, bundle by going to Customization, Suite Bundler, Search and Install Bundles. From there, you'll search for uh, the name Suite Solutions Shared Vendor Bill and uh, select that bundle and then click Install to begin the installation process. And once that process uh, you know, completes and you've refreshed that page until it's 100% uh, installed, you can then configure the general preferences for uh, the Shared Vendor Bill. That's under setup, company, general preferences. And if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see a sub tab for custom preferences. That should show you uh, any of these 
fields that are specific to the uh, suit solutions and uh, for the shared vendor bill specifically, that's where you find this information here. This is all going to be blank. Uh, so when you um, install the bundle, you're going to have admin documentation associated with that bundle that you can download. And it will walk you through these uh, initial steps to configure this, the uh, shared vendor bill. And these values that you see populated into any of these fields here are included in that um, admin documentation that's provided along with the bundle. So when I set this up, I was just copying and pasting that information into these fields. But I will just draw your attention to the uh, advanced intercompany journals, which I um, made sure is enabled because we will be using this for intercompany distributions. And what that means is that when the uh, shared vendor bill is approved, there will be a um, generated uh, uh, advanced company journal entry that actually performs the allocation. Another um, way that you'll see your account changed upon installing the bundle is that there will be a new custom record in your account called a uh, bill distribution schedule. So you can find your bill distribution schedules under lists, custom, uh, shared vendor bill bill distribution schedule and that'll pull up the list for you. So what these are is uh, a totally customizable uh, way to uh, distribute your expenses. You can define on the bill distribution schedule how um, non-inventory items like service items or expenses get split into departments uh, as I mentioned for like an intra-company distribution or across subsidiaries for an inter-company distribution. You can apply these schedules two vendor bills, uh, and in the case of a percentage-based distribution, you could specify a default allocation weight for each uh, line in your bill distribution schedule. And um, you can choose to you know, distribute these amounts across either um, segments or entities. Okay, this is um, the form that you would see if you go follow the navigation on the previous screen to uh, list custom shared vendor bill, bill distribution schedule new. This is the uh, shared uh, vendor bill, bill distribution schedule form here. Uh, so initially, you're just going to be presented with this header information. You want to populate this with uh, you know, a name that's specific to the subsidiary uh, that this distribution schedule is uh, applied to. You specify that subsidiary in the source subsidiary field drop down there. Uh, so yeah, the source subsidiary is just the subsidiary to which the distribution schedule applies. Um, also, there are several uh, options in the middle of the screen that you might see in there. Um, if it's an intercompany uh, distribution schedule, you want to make sure that that is flagged. Also, uh, source segments, you would enable that if you want the location, class, department, or any other custom segments on the journal entry to be the same as specified on the vendor bill expense line item. And so that's referring to the, uh, the advanced intercompany journal entry that's created from the vendor bill upon approval. Also. Um, enabling source accounts is if you want the expense and item accounts on the journal entry to be the same as those specified on the vendor bill expense line item. Okay. So those are a few options there. And then once you've entered all that information into the header and saved, you have the ability to add distribution schedule line. But to configure these lines, and I'm going to put the emphasis now on the intercompany bill distribution schedule, um, you need to make sure that you set up some intercompany uh, entities and accounts in advance. So uh, this is just saying that you know, intercompany bill distribution schedule lines depend on you know, the configuration of your intercompany accounts receivable accounts, uh, accounts payable accounts, intercompany customers, and intercompany vendors. So. This here is uh, just a slide devoted to those intercompany accounts. Um, so to set up your intercompany AR account, you want to make sure that the source subsidiary must receive the distributed amount from the destination subsidiaries for all the allocated expenses. So the intercompany AR account must be available to the source subsidiary and the elimination subsidiaries. Whereas with the intercompany AP account, we want the destination subsidiary that receives the distributed expense pays the expense to the source subsidiary as to a vendor Therefore, the intercompany account stable account must be available to the destination and elimination subsidiaries. And this note on the bottom here is saying that when you go to create the account, you need to enable this flag, uh, enable uh, eliminate intercompany transactions. So 
this is an example of a intercompany AR account I created. Here, I just gave this a generic name of intercompany AR, and I classified it as an accounts receivable type account. Um, these accounts have to be uh, either AR or AP type accounts. Then um, you're able to in, uh, enable this flag right here, the eliminate intercompany transactions flag. And also made sure that this is shared across all subsidiaries uh, by just selecting the global entity and uh, enabling the include children flag here. And I did the same setup for the intercompany AP account, just only difference being that this is an accounts payable type account. Next, uh, we're ready to move on to configuring the intercompany customers and intercompany vendors. A little note on this. Um, you'll be creating your intercompany vendors and customers the same way that you create your standard uh, vendors or customers, but uh, that is to say, following the same navigation path, though you may need to customize the form or create a new version of the customer vendor entry forms that expose a certain field shown here, this represents subsidiary field. So when creating an intercompany customer, uh, we want to specify a primary subsidiary and a represents subsidiary, and we'll do the same for intercompany vendors. Uh, customer, the, the primary subsidiary corresponds to the source subsidiary in which the customer is based, where the represents subsidiary is the destination subsidiary to which the expenses are distributed. For a vendor, the primary subsidiary is the destination subsidiary to which the expenses are distributed, and the represent subsidiary is the source subsidiary that the expense is distributed from. So in that way, they're almost like mirror images. Here, I've created a intercompany customer that is reflecting the AR that subsidiary one gets from subsidiary two. Here, I've got the primary subsidiary as US one, and the represent subsidiary, which I exposed on this form, is US two. And then on intercompany vendor, this is representing the payable that US two pays to US one. So here, the primary subsidiary is US two, and the represent subsidiary is US one. So when going to add a new bill distribution schedule line, this is the form uh, that you're presented with. So in uh, this screenshot here, allocation weight is an enabled field. This is a, an example where we're creating a, a percentage-based distribution. If we, uh, if we uh, selected amount-based distribution on the uh, header of the bill distribution schedule, um, this field would be disabled. So that's the allocation weight here. But if it is a percentage based, we're able to specify some default weights on here. So if we say 50% of the expense to be uh, allocated to the subsidiary one and 50% should be allocated to subsidiary two, that would be the default weight um, applied to a uh, vendor bill on the, uh, 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 the bill distribution schedule. Uh, alternatively, though, if it's an amount based, we have to configure that ourselves, uh, specifying what amount of the expense line is allocated to one subsidiary or the other. Um, so destination subsidiary here is the destination subsidiary for the distributed expense. Um, for intercompany distribution schedules, the first bill distribution line is for the source subsidiary. And uh, um, that's that's pretty much all you would enter for the first line. So where it says destination subsidiary here, you would just enter the subsidiary, the, the source subsidiary specified in the header of the bill distribution schedule. And for the next subsequent lines, you can enter the destination subsidiaries to which the uh, expense would be allocated. And for those, you need to specify the intercompany AR customer and the intercompany vendor and intercompany AP. Okay. So the intercompany vendor there, uh, or I'm sorry, the intercompany uh, AR is the um, account receivable account you created for the source subsidiary that tracks the amount due from the destination subsidiary. And the intercompany customer is the customer you created for the combination of source and destination subsidiaries. And the intercompany AP is the uh, account and the destination subsidiary 
uh, account payable account in the destination subsidiary to the source subsidiary. And the company vendor is the vendor you created for this combination of source and uh, destination subsidiaries. Okay. So here's an example of a simple bill distribution schedule I configured with lines. So this is a um, in, uh, an amount-based distribution schedule. Um, it's an intercompany allocation, and I have enabled amount-based here. This allocation weight 100% is just automatically enabled because this is an amount-based distribution. Uh, when adjusting the distribution on an actual vendor bill, the uh, you will have to make sure that the amounts are adding up to 100% of the uh, total amount of the expense line. This is just automatically enabled for the uh, amount-based. Whereas if I specified a, a percentage-based distribution, I'd have to make sure that those uh, weights specified on the lines are also totaling up to 100%. As we can see here, I've set this as the source subsidiary being subsidiary one. So the first line in the bill distribution schedule is just the destination subsidiary as the source subsidiary. Then the subsequent line, I'm specifying the destination subsidiary US2 and the intercompany AR, intercompany AP, intercompany customer, and intercompany vendor. And I can add, you know, if there was a US3, I could add uh, you know, the intercompany AR and AP again and whatever customers or vendors I set up for that combination of uh, source and destination entities. Okay, so now we're ready to get into a little bit of the use of shared vendor bills. So to create a shared vendor bill, just follow the standard navigation path for creating a vendor bill. It's just transactions, payables, enter bills. You want to make sure when you first get to that page that you change the form to the shared vendor bill form. And you want to make sure that this is in a pending approval state. The reason uh, for that is because, as I mentioned earlier, when the vendor bill is approved, it will create the allocation uh, journal entry. and um, if we continue to make adjustments, there will be reversal journal entries and uh, new journal entries associated with the vendor bill. So uh, just to, until we've finalized the distribution weights, we want to make sure that this is set in a pending approval state to avoid all those uh, you know, reversal journal entries. So on that form, we'll select the vendor and wait for the form to refresh. Then select the subsidiary if uh, we've got you know, uh, 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 vendors spread across subsidiaries, or if not, we can just allow the field to auto populate based on whatever specified as the primary subsidiary for that vendor. Then we'll select the uh, subsidiary specific bill distribution schedule to apply the shared vendor bill. So you can see that in this screen here, I've specified a vendor. Um, that is sending some expense to uh, US1 that we know is, needs to be allocated across multiple subsidiaries. That's why we're using the shared vendor bill form. So I selected all steel here as a vendor, waited for the form to refresh. Um, US1 automatically populated there in the subsidiary field. And then that allowed uh, uh, this drop down to become available and we were able to select the appropriate bill distribution schedule for the subsidiary. And upon selecting that, these two flags become enabled that the schedule is intercompany and the schedule is amount based. So once that uh, information is all finalized in the header and uh, any other mandatory fields um, are populated, you can then enter the expense lines that need to be allocated across subsidiaries. So scroll down to the expenses and line sub tab and add in uh, an expense that is to be allocated. Here I've just entered in a general insurance expense for a nice even number of $1,000 that we need to allocate across those entities. And then we can click Save, find you in a pending approval state. So here we can see that this is the bill saved in a pending approval state, and we have the option now uh, to adjust the distribution. So because this is amount-based, um, there are not yet uh, predefined weights. Uh, so if it had been percentage based with a 50% weight for each line in the bill distribution schedule, it would automatically have a 50%, you know, $500 allocated to subsidiary one, $500 allocated to subsidiary two. But because this is uh, amount based, we have to adjust the distribution and specify the amounts for each line. So we'll click this button here and it takes us to this screen 
where we can see our expense line broken out uh, for each line in the bill distribution schedule. So we can see this on the left side of your screen here, you can see this is line one broken out for each line in the bill distribution schedule for subsidiary one and then subsidiary two. And we're gonna enter in the amounts here where it says transaction currency amount. Here I just selected the first line entered 500 and hit enter. And we can see the current line total is 500. The line total for the insurance expense on the original vendor bill was 1,000. So we still have 500 remaining to distribute. If I enter 500 in here and hit enter, this will all clear out. And we can click OK and then submit. And then you can view the bill distribution details on the bill again. We can see that the amount based validations have passed. We've got the um, amounts of 500 allocated to each of the uh, subsidiaries in the bill distribution schedule. And we can see that there's not yet an allocation journal created for this bill because it is saved still in a pending approval state. So the next step would be to approve it. We'll just edit the bill, change the approval status to approved and click save. So that's shown on this screenshot here. I've edited the bill. I'm changing the approval status on the right hand side there, making it approved and saving. And that is showing uh, now, I mean, I'm sorry, after, after approving the bill, we wanna to go to the uh, bill distribution detail sub tab of the bill again, and we can now see that there is an allocation journal entry uh, created for this bill. So we can click that hyperlink and view the advanced intercompany journal entry that was created. And we can see the um, four lines in uh, advanced intercompany journal, two for each subsidiary. So we can see from US-1, we're crediting this uh, third expense for $500 and debiting the intercompany AR account for 500. And for subsidiary two, we're crediting the intercompany AP and debiting the insurance expense here. And we can see the intercompany uh, entities tagged in these lines. Here's the intercompany customer we set up and here's the intercompany vendor on the uh, second and third lines here. And in the memo, we have this helpful uh, system generated from vendor bill note here. So we know which vendor bill this is associated with and that um, any, any uh, intercompany journal entries with this memo, we would know that these were created from a shared vendor bill. Okay. We can also uh, go back to the original vendor bill and view the GL impact of that. So this is showing the total expense line um, we have a credit to account payable of a thousand and a debit to the insurance expense for a thousand. And this is just uh, associated with the US one subsidiary. Okay. So I think we have enough time here for a little demo. Yes. So gonna... Okay, cool. I think that's enough time. So I'm going to go right here into NetSuite. Um, I've got the shared vendor bill form here selected. I've already selected my vendor. Made sure that this is an appending approval state. Um, selected my bill distribution schedule here. Uh, other mandatory fields I've populated. I will just now enter an expense account. I need to refresh the form. Okay. Something else I would uh, also like to mention is that we have the option to exclude any lines. So I'm, I'll just zoom in a little bit. We have the option to exclude any lines from the uh, bill distribution uh, schedule. So 
if we have multiple expense lines here, but only some of them are being allocated across uh, subsidiaries. We can pick and choose which ones to include in the bill distribution schedule, but I'm just going to include this line and continue. So we've got all of this information specified here We're on the shared vendor bill form as the uh, expense line. Bill distribution details tab doesn't show any information yet, so I'm going to save this in a pending approval state. Yep, so this is uh, now saved. We can go to the bill distribution details sub tab here. We can see our lines, but with no uh, amount specified. So we need to adjust the distribution by clicking this button here. It takes us to the screen. Watch this uh, top right part here. I'm going to click this line. So we can see the uh, current line total is zero. We have to distribute $1,000 left. Enter 500 here, 500 here. And we can see that that's all cleared out. I'll submit this. This is just saying you're changing the weights. Click OK. OK, now uh, that will close the tab and automatically refresh the form. So wait for the form to uh, finish loading. And we can scroll down and view that bill distribution detail sub tab one more time. We can now see that the amounts are populated and the amount based validations have passed. 100% of the expense line is allocated. So now I'm going to edit this and approve it. And I will save. And Tim, while we're waiting for that to finish, we have a question that came in for you from Barbara Stamp. Can you show a distribution by department? I don't have one prep for the session, but um, I could uh, look into setting that up and following up uh, with you uh, after this. That would be great. Okay. So there we go. This is approved. See the bill distribution details. We can see that the journal entry has been created. Also note that we still have the option to continue to adjust this distribution. Uh, we can adjust the distribution again. Um, and what, what that will do is it will make this allocation journal jump up to 606. So we can see it's number 604 in sequence here. Um, if I continue to adjust the distribution, uh, this first uh, journal entry would then have a reversal. Um, so this would be reversed and that would be number 605. And then a new allocation journal entry would be associated with vendor bill uh, 6667. And that would be number 606. So it's for that reason that we uh, continue to recommend uh, saving and editing a, a distribution entirely in a pending approval state. But anyway, this is the intercompany journal entry with those lines uh, shown up correctly. This is the allocation happening on the uh, journal entry. And then on the bill itself, I can uh, view the GL impact here. And I can see that $1,000 expense. Okay. And uh, that is really it for my session. All right, Tim, thanks so much. Uh, we've got a couple minutes here. Anybody have any open questions um, that they would like to pose? We can look to the Q&A pane, uh, type your questions in there. Um, I see a question from Bob Simone. If the bill is deleted, will the allocation JE be automatically deleted as well? Good question. I will, uh, I will delete this bill and uh, <laughs> I will, I, I don't think that the, uh, allocation journal entry is actually linked to the original bill. So there, uh, you might notice that it's, uh, referencing the bill to which it is linked in the line memo on the intercompany journal entry, but I don't think it's actually linked as like a uh, related record. So, I will 
run an experiment here. Um, another question while we're doing that from Ken, uh, is there an incremental cost for shared vendor bill or is this uh, part of NetSuite native? So if you purchase, for example, financials first, uh, shared vendor bill is usually the last bill, uh, I mean, the last bundle to install in the bill deployment guide. So it is um, included, I believe, in, uh, in a certain um, you know, Sweet Success modules. So if you purchase, like, yeah, Sweet Success Financials First Standard or Premium, um, it would uh, that that spill is uh, this bundle router is included. Yeah, as always, just to make sure on those things, talk with your partner or your rep, and uh, they'll be able to to track that information down for you. I am going to say thank you to Tim and thank you to Karen. Uh, if you have any questions for Tim or Karen uh, throughout the the day, you know, please feel free to hit up that Q and A section. Um, and we're also going to have an open Q and A session at the end of our presentation today. Um, so a big round of applause, virtual. I know I'm the only one you can hear clapping right now. But thank you, uh, Tim. And thank you, Karen from BSP for your presentations today. All right. Um, hey, NetSuite user group members, where are you dialing in from today? Uh, tell us about uh, where you're, you're coming in. Use the chat panel for that instead of the Q&A. So hop on chat. Tell us where you're coming in from. I'm coming to everyone from Long Beach, New York. Michelle is in Long Beach. I'm also on Long Island, but not in Long Beach, uh, coming to you from uh, East Northport, New York. And we see there's a few people on from Irvine, Newport Beach, San Francisco, Laguna Beach. I'd love to be there right now. Then we have some from Raleigh, North Carolina, Albany, San Diego. Do we have anyone from Texas? I see Cape Coral, Florida, Flanders, New Jersey, San Mateo. All the Sands are here. California representing San Jose, San Francisco, San Mateo. Well, we'd like to thank everyone for coming out today. It really means a lot. And these user groups are for all of you. So thank you for taking a few hours out of your day to join us. All right, I'm gonna check in on our ASLF uh, fundraising goal. We are 10% of the way there, 10%, a little over 10% of the way to our fundraising goal. Remember, every dollar that you donate today is gonna to get matched by uh, the New York, the NorCal, and the SoCal NetSuite user groups. Uh, we're trying to raise $6,000 today from our members so that we can donate $12,000 in total uh, to this wonderful cause. Um, stick around, stay tuned, you're gonna hear uh, from the founder uh, of the organization, Jay Scott, in our keynote session. Um, this is our webpage. Uh, please come visit, donate. I'm going to refresh. Did we get any new donations? 680. There you go. That's what we want to see. All right. So we just got another $20. Um, let's keep the momentum going. Um, and now I'm going to switch back to our presentation here. And I am. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Miller from uh, Avalara, and he's going to talk to you about uh, their solution. Tom, how's it going? It's going well, Craig. Thanks for the introduction, and it's, it's great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. My old and, friend, a pleasure as always. <laughs> oh, great. And I want to say hello to everybody that's online. Thanks for your time today. It's, it's great to be with you. I look forward to being face-to-face -face when uh, we get back to things as normal. Um, but we've been talking for, for a lot of years now that, that, that sales tax is not only mandated, but, but let's face it, it's, it's really tough. To get it right, there's a lot that you need to know. I mean, first you need to know where your nexus is. That's where you have the obligation to collect the tax. And then you need to know if the product or service is taxable, where you're delivering it to. And you need to know which of up to 16,000 overlapping jurisdictions need to be applied to the transaction. That information tells you what the rate is and what the taxability rules are, but then you need to know if your customer's tax exempt or not and be able to prove it. The, uh, the only acceptable proof point is a valid tax exempt certificate. 
And then after all that's done, you deal with the chore of collecting all sales transactions from all your systems and websites, boiling them down into a spreadsheet so a tax return can be reproduced every period that must be filed accurately and naturally paid on time with the proper remittance. All of that while at the same time be fully documenting it for an audit that might not come for three or four years down the road. And all of that needs to be done instantaneously at the magic moment. That's the point of sale in a way that ensures complete customer satisfaction. That's a momentous task. And then you need to do the same thing all over again with use tax. You know, use tax is the other side of the sales tax coin. When you sell something, you collect a sales tax. But when you buy something and the vendor doesn't charge you or incorrectly charges the sales tax, you owe the use tax on the transaction. So on the next slide, I'm very happy to introduce the Avalara Consumer Use Tax Module. This is a self-assessment workflow automation tool for those who want to edit, analyze, and manage how and where their purchases are used. It has built-in taxability rules and rates that track jurisdiction regulations to support ongoing tax compliance so you can identify overpaid and underpaid taxes and where you need to request vendor rebills. It provides a productive and flexible workflow automation for transaction filtering, editing, review, allocation, and documentation of compliance. It can allocate or split transactions to accrue in multiple jurisdictions based on line item, percentage, or item amounts to support accurate allocation. Supports automated curation and acceptance from trusted vendors and sets transaction flags for human review. And we support multiple transaction types, purchase orders, inventory usage, movement, fixed asset movement, things like that. Avalara consumer use efficiently handles high transaction volumes and our use tax reporting enables process controls that can create the general ledger cost center assignment, the journal entry, the tax liability summary and decision documentation so you're fully supported in an audit. ACU will consume transactions regardless of their source to enable aggregation and central control of all use tax accrual decisions. And it can be run as a standalone system, but it is fully integrated with Avatax Calc and Avatax Returns. So use tax accruals can flow directly to the filing process to automate sales and return preparation. We would love to spend some time speaking with you about this, showing you the module, get in touch with your consultant or your, um, your, your NetSuite provider, whatever we can do to help. I look forward to speaking with everyone. Thanks, Greg. I'll turn it back to you now. Thanks, Tom. Consummate professional, even as I'm having technical difficulties. Thank you for barreling forward. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> I interrupted your slides with uh, the wrong screen there. Hey, worse could happen. Hey, you know, every now and again, you got to look behind the curtain and see the wizard pulling the, uh, the strings, right? <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Well, thank you. All right. We're going to run back to the don't forget to donate. Uh, we are a little over 10% of our way towards our goal. We're trying to raise $12,000 today to fight childhood cancer, and we would love your help. Um, so hop on that link. Um, make a difference today. And at 145, we're going to be hearing from the founder of Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation and how they're leading the fight against childhood cancer with the power of NetSuite in their corner. All right. For every dollar you donate today, ALSF gets two. So open your hearts and open your wallets. And another big shout out to Natasha and Rosalind for donating some little more money and a few of our anonymous donations as well. Love it. Love to see those donations come in. And thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Um, we, uh, we've we been working hard for uh, this tie-in with uh, Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. Um, it's our theme for the quarter, and uh, we really appreciate your participation. All right. Um, next up, uh, we have something real special. So, I mean, our user group uh, on the East Coast and the West Coast um, has always found a friend in Gavin Davidson. Um, he's worked with us to talk about um, the new releases coming to NetSuite, the exciting roadmap features, um, and he's really uh, become uh, a regular figure at our user group events. And um, we reached out and, uh, and Gavin said, hey, you know, why don't we get Evan involved too? Um, and 
Uh, unfortunately, Evan Goldberg, the founder and EVP of, uh, of NetSuite, is not able to join us live today. Um, uh, he is traveling right now, and um, he did yesterday record uh, about 20 minutes of, uh, of engagement um, specifically for us, not to be used anywhere else, you know, uh, addressing our user group today. Um, and Gavin's going to present that. Uh, as well as going to his presentation about 2020.2. So, uh, Gavin, hey, how's it going? It's uh, it's going well. How are you? Good. Really nice to see you. I'm going to share my video, say hello at my my virtual lemonade stand here. Um, uh, number one, thanks as always for coming uh, to the user group and educating our users about the exciting new updates and features and all of the product uh, progress that happens uh, throughout the bi-yearly updates from NetSuite. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, it's so important to stay abreast of what NetSuite offers um, and especially in, in the roadmap and all of the new features that are you know, developed from the feedback of the users and developed because you know, our community says, hey, th this is something that I want NetSuite to invest in, right? Yeah, and as you'll see in the, in the interview, that's something that I asked Evan about it specifically. I mean, um, when I'm in uh, internal roadmap sessions with Evan and, and Gary, uh, Gary Wissinger, who runs uh, product management, you know, they are always asking, you know, which of the top enhancement requests are we delivering this, this release or what's in progress and, and that sort of thing. And there's, there's, uh, there's one big one in, in, the, in the second release this year. So um, it's always exciting to see those things come to fruition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you, you got a chance to, to chat with Evan, I think it was yesterday, right? And last, uh, so last night, just before he got on the plane. Just before he got on the plane. Nothing like the last minute, right? Yeah. Um, and you have that, uh, that conversation queued up for our, our user group. So I'm going to hand the screen control over to you. Um, and uh, let's be sure to share that audio like we practiced before. And uh, we're going to okay. play that for everybody now. We sure are. Enjoy. Okay, great. Um, so welcome everyone. And today we're excited to be joined by Evan Goldberg, founder of NetSuite and EVP of the Oracle NetSuite Global Business Unit. Welcome Evan. Hi Gavin, thanks for having me. Well, we're really excited. I've done a few of these user group events, uh, a couple virtually now. Um, and we gave the users a chance to sub submit some questions. So we thought we'd start with some of those. Sounds great. Um, and so the first one, no surprise, is around uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic, which of course has pretty much affected everyone across the globe. Um, do you have any advice for NetSuite users who are maybe struggling to terms with, with this new reality and working from home and everything that goes with yeah, it? Yeah, well, I don't presume to know the details of everybody's businesses. I can kind of give some perspective from our business and some of the things I've seen from some of our customers. Um, so you know, certainly I think NetSuite is no different uh, than many businesses that have had to rapidly adapt to remote work. Um, you know, we use obviously cloud-based software to run our business and we use Zoom really heavily to stay connected. I mean, one of the things that's great is um, that I think will hopefully continue after this time um, is that people are using video on Zoom a lot more. And so we're a very distributed organization. I think obviously a lot of, a lot of companies are anyway. And to be able to get to see people's faces um, from, you know, sometimes from around the world, um, I think is, is cool. It's, and, and I hope that that continues after the pandemic. So, you know, that's kind of the basic stuff I'm sure that everybody's uh, doing right now. Individual businesses, um, based on their business model, are making all kinds of adaptations. Um, we have some customers that have done some really cool stuff. Bedford Industries basically completely shifted from making food twist ties to making face shields. Um, and they're selling them direct, you know, direct to consumer now, where they were mostly a B2B company before. Um, like Customers like Second City and School of Rock um, they've had to move all their sort of in-person classes to online and record speed, sort of what we're seeing schools try to do, um, uh, you know, all over the, all over the world. And, uh, so obviously, uh, being creative, um, and, 
you know, that's one of the benefits of being a fast growing business is you're sort of already used to rapid changes. And uh, so that's why I think a lot of our customers have been able to be so creative in adapting. Sure. And it's funny because I've, I've been here almost 10 years now. And as you know, I started doing, doing demos back then. Um, and we've got a lot of questions by then about, you know, could we buy the on-premise version of NetSuite? And we said, well, no, there's no, there's no on-premise version of, of NetSuite. Mm -hmm. um, and they'd ask, well, what happens if the internet goes down? So we talk about redundancy. And we'd always throw in, though, that, you know, at the end of the day, you could go and work from Starbucks, or you could go and run your business from home or wherever. And here we are, like, 10 years later, and uh, you know, that's... Yeah, on, it's good that we didn't the big... sell the on-premise version of NetSuite. <laughs> no, no on-premise version. So looking forward, um, what sort of challenges do you see for the next 10 years? Well, you know, I mean, I'm pretty confident we're going to get through this. <laughs> there's going to be a new normal. And um, obviously there's going to be, as we talked about, people will hopefully still be doing video Zoom. There'll be some things that we've learned about how we can operate our businesses more effectively, more efficiently from what we've done. But of course, a lot of things are going to go back to how they were before. We all want that. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the challenges are going to be similar, um, but maybe the pace of technological change may be even faster. Um, adapting, you know, your business model, what, you know, whatever sort of indus whatever industry you're in to those rapid changes is certainly going to remain a challenge. And I think um, how you reach customers um, through new media, social media, I mean, there's the next generation of uh, you know, customers and employees that are coming um, into companies and up the ranks that you know, present, well, certainly they present new blood that can kind of uh, bring into your company new ideas. They also present challenges in how they may be interacting and how they get you know, reached through different means. So I think it'll be similar. Um, you know, I think a lot of customers will return to fast growth and those fast growth challenges you know, keeping visibility into your operations, you know, retaining control as you grow and as you become um, spread over the country or potentially around the world. Um, you know, I think that's, that's those are going to return to to critical challenges and, and hopefully, um, you know, the things that we've done at NetSuite will, you know, continue to help companies uh, meet those challenges. One of the things that our user groups are always interested in, of course, is the roadmap. So what are you excited about in terms of the roadmap for NetSuite as a business platform? Yeah, well, um, you know, we're certainly continually trying to improve NetSuite for your type of business. And, um, you know, we uh, offer NetSuite to a variety of different industries. Um, one of the things that we found is commonalities between industries um, that maybe, you know, because we have sort of a pretty broad reach um, we've you know we've, we've been able to take advantage of and I think you'll see that especially in some of the real horizontal business processes that are very common that we're going to double down on uh, making those more streamlined um, saving keystrokes saving clicks uh, making them easier to learn easier to understand so these are things like bank reconciliation um, uh, cl period close processes um, sales processes you know, that really exist across most of our, most of our customers. I think that's where a lot of the innovation um, is going to come um, over the coming releases. While we still continue to uh, make NetSuite right for you, if we, you know, if you're a manufacturer or, or if you're a uh, consulting company or a, an agency or, or what have you. Of course. So looking at the new release, there's lots of great features coming out. Um, I was very interested in the invoice grouping, um, having been in many, roadmap sessions with you over the years. You're always harping on making sure that we hit some of those top enhancement requests. Yeah, well, this is the top of the top. <laughs> this has been up there for a while. There's almost as many ways that people want to do invoice grouping as there are people that want to do invoice grouping. So <laughs> that's been sort of the challenge, why it's taken us so long. And this will be a process where we continually add more use cases but we did a lot of research with a lot of customers to figure out you know, this initial approach. And we do believe, and uh, obviously our design partners, <laughs> many of them um, like the approach we've taken and I'm excited about it. But if it doesn't work for you, stay tuned because it's something that we know that's, that's incredibly important. Being able to present um, a really simple interface or you know, kind of 
simple interface to your use to your customers for them to be able to pay. Um, they can sort of go to one place, find it, and pay it. Um, that's certainly certainly our goal across the board. So, bottom line, enhancement requests work, and we should uh, have, make sure that our customers keep on entering them. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways um, to get feedback to us. That's definitely a good one. We do pay attention to that. Um, but uh, you know, there's other ways, you know, obviously the way we got that invoice grouping done is because there were customers that were willing to participate as sort of design partners and give us feedback and do user testing, et cetera. So that's a critical part of the process for sure. So of course my personal favorite feature of this release is uh, MRP, good old material requirements planning. So that's been around since the seventies. Um, how do we make a difference in terms of how we implement a really old idea and make it work better as part of the NetSuite yeah. platform? Well, I mean, planning in general is trying to extrapolate from the past um, and what's gonna happen in the future. And then obviously um, doing everything you need to meet that, that future sort of prediction. Um, and I think that, you know, where NetSuite has an opportunity, especially in product companies who are, um, use a lot of the different parts of the suite is to take um, that information that we have and help make better predictions. And I think that's certainly the direction we'll be um, going with, with these capabilities in the future. I mean, we always are thinking, how can we take advantage of uh, the suite and the fact that we have, um, you know, we have sales information, we have inventory information, we have, um, you know, obviously you know, for those who are using suite people, we have employee information. I mean, how can we take advantage of all of that information uh, to sort of predict the future better and help and there and thereby help you help you plan better. So is that sweetness as we call it, is that is that you what you think makes NetSuite stand out still over the competition? Absolutely. We've thought that way from the very, very beginning. Our vision has always been about um, a single you know, one system um, to help tie to get together your disparate operations. And, uh, you know, that, that was one of the reasons that we, you know, really is sort of almost logically prior to the fact that we delivered as a service. Um, once you decided, I'm going to build a product that's going to not only just be for a couple people in finance, but it's also going to be for a bunch of people in sales, and it's going to be for a bunch of people in the warehouse, and it's going to be for a bunch of project managers, um, you know, then you realize that it's a pretty complex, even for 10, 20, 50 person company, it's a pretty complex application and that that's not something that we expect customers uh, to be able to manage themselves. So it was really this idea of the suite um, that was sort of in some sense logically prior then made us say, okay, well, obviously we have to deliver this um, as a service. So I do a lot of work with um, analysts, industry analysts as well, et cetera. They're always asking about what we're doing around AI, machine learning, that sort of thing. Yeah. So what's the NetSuite approach to how we integrate you know, these really advanced technologies and uh, deliver yeah. them to the customers? Right. And so we haven't like, you know, branded an AI engine, you know, Hal or, um, you know, uh, Watson or whatever, you know, whatever name you want to give to your super AI. Speedy we're kind AI. of looking at it a little differently. Um, we're trying to uh, reimagine your daily processes that take time and that may be error prone um, and how we can make them better. And sometimes that involves intelligence. And so that's where it sort of is going to start. Um, you know, if you take the, to really think about the, the user centered kind of issues and problems, like how do you, predict risk of projects. So you can, you know, everyone wants to be able to get projects that are kind of veering off course back on track, the earlier, the better. It's an example of where um, maybe we can use AI to better predict uh, which of these projects are, are going to run into issues. Um, you know, and on the product side, it's similar with things like uh, orders and shipments and, and how can we use AI to better predict it because that's what people do, you know, that's what project managers um, do on a day-to-day -day basis is is try to make sure that their projects stay on track and you know people running um, Product business. How do I keep my orders on track? And so we've been you know, we mentioned supply planning 
um, that, you know, that's a great area for us to be able to maybe uh, use some intelligence to do a better job at that. So, so really just, we have the AI technologies available just like everybody else does. Um, we're trying to apply them in ways that will deliver real value and that you can count on. Um, you know, you know, when, when you can count on something like Waze now and, and, or, you know, right. that it tells you that there's traffic and, and you pretty much believe it. Um, yeah. we can't have stuff that's right. You know, you wouldn't want the traffic prediction to be right 30% of the time, right? I mean, you want it to be right like 90% of the time. So I think starting with the problem, figuring out where AI can do a good job. Um, and if it can't do a good job, let's not do it now. Maybe in five years, it'll do a better job. So that's sort of how's, how, how's guiding the problems that we're applying uh, machine learning and AI technology to. Yes, of course, one of the advantages of being um, part of Oracle is that they spend a lot of time and money on all these advanced technologies, emerging mm -hmm. technologies, some of which we might never, might never actually materialize. Um, so what's next with, uh, in terms of, of what we might expect to see from- Yeah, well, are we in the vault? Yes, I think so. It's just, just you and me. Um, I think one that uh, maybe some uh, people in the user group, this user group might find interesting is that, um, you know, Oracle, if you've paid any attention, has been focused on autonomous database as a kind of underlying technology that it offers. And this is a, a database that's kind of managed with AI. Um, and it's, it's it, you know, you don't have to be a database expert to take advantage of the ability to ask questions. Um, and so, you know, we think that there's a real opportunity there for NetSuite customers that have a lot of data, both in their NetSuite account, as well as maybe in other systems, uh, to use uh, Oracle's autonomous data warehouse product as sort of an, as a NetSuite data warehouse. Um, so easily get the data in and you know out of out of NetSuite on a periodic basis, be able to mash up with other data, um, and then use Oracle's um, analytic tools, Analytics Cloud, um, to do analysis on the data. So that's something that um, you're going to see. Uh, coming out in the next few months. We're excited about that. And that's, you know, really powered by Oracle's, um, you know, database, their next generation database technology. The other thing is that we're moving to OCI, Oracle's cloud infrastructure, the Oracle, um, it, you know, cloud. Um, we already have customers running on it. Um, soon, um, within, uh, in the next year or so, all customers that are new will be running on it, and then we'll be moving customers in a way that you know we expect will not be disruptive to you um, and will ultimately provide big benefits. I think some of the benefits will just be um, the scale that we can achieve there. We're moving on onto Oracle's um, most powerful hardware. Um, so I think it's gonna be performance and scaling um, benefits there for fast growing, obviously for fast growing companies. Um, there's also a lot of technology in OCI that's available and we'll obviously be using some of it. You know, the, some of the AI technology we'll be using inside a NetSuite. You won't even have to do anything. It'll just happen. Um, but also for people developing on the NetSuite, plat the Suite Cloud platform, um, we'll be making those, some of those technologies available. That means that our partners will be able to build more powerful applications, take advantage of AI, take advantage of the Oracle Digital Assistant, um, some of these other technologies, you know, directly from inside our platform. So we're, that's another thing we're pretty excited about. Great. Last question, and this, this is a user group after all. So I'm sure the customers would like to know, so how can they get involved more? How, what can they do to contribute to the future yeah. evolution of NetSuite? Yeah, well, I mean, we, are, we really want to make sure that there's lots and lots of avenues for, uh, for us to listen to customers and learn from customers. And so, you know, we talked about, obviously, um, uh, feedback, uh, you know, through enhancement requests, participating in design, uh, thinking design sessions, you know, when you get the opportunity, especially on areas that you're particularly interested in, that your company uses heavily. Um, certainly, um, you know, these user groups, um, just to share information and, you know, within um, a group of sort of like-minded people and then being able to feed, feed that back, you know, understanding um, some of the patterns that you might be seeing among customers and then feeding that back to us, I think is really helpful. Uh, and certainly uh, Sweet World. I mean, we, Sweet World is a little bit on hold right now, but when things go back, that's one of the things that I'm confident we'll want to uh, 
get right on. Um, that's a great opportunity to interact. And we'll have, we'll have things that, you know, resemble that before we are actually all gathered together again. Um, and, but the, you know, that, that event uh, really gives you an opportunity to directly meet with, uh, you know, we send as many product people as we can. Um, so you directly meet with product people and uh, hear from them, obviously in the sessions, but, you know, also meet them in the, in the hallways, you know, imagine that meeting someone in the hallway rather than I know. on Zoom. It's, it's going to happen. <laughs> One of these days. Well, that was excellent. I uh, can't thank you uh, enough for your time today. And um, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Gavin. Really appreciate it. Okay. Wow, Gavin. That was awesome. Uh, I'm so glad that you guys were able to have that conversation. Um, lots of yes. lots of really interesting tidbits in there. You know, future Good looking, yeah. what we're doing today. And I just, I really do appreciate and love the messaging around the users and, and how uh, we can get involved and how you want to hear from us. So um, awesome. Any, any additional context you want to add to that conversation before? We yeah. Well, there's a couple, couple of things. Um, well, well, first of all, if you ever meet Evan and you want to have a long conversation, then just talk, just mention it on this database and <laughs> it won't go on for a long, long time. He loves that stuff. Um, and he mentioned Street World there, there, so this has not been published yet, but there is going to be some kind of virtual event in September, October. Um, so uh, we're, working on, we're working towards that right now, so stay tuned for that. Excellent, excellent. All right, so uh, I think we've had a little look into the crystal ball. We've, uh, we've gotten uh, the founder's uh, perspective. Um, why don't we talk uh, details now? 2020.2 is out. And uh, it is the, the second half. Uh, so 2020.1, we've been with for six months now. Now we're talking 2020.2. Uh, what do you got in store for us? Okay, so I wanted to start with uh, just a little overview of, um, of how we do the release. Um, not everyone is aware of how this all works. So there's basically four phases. The first phase, we upgrade ourselves. We use NetSuite, so uh, nobody really sees that. So, but, so our, our account gets upgraded. Um, some early demo accounts got upgraded, and then we give partners access to, to that so they can start doing testing, et cetera. There's then three customer phases. There's a rough percentage here that I'm showing you in terms of the percentage of customers that go. Um, most customers are in phase three. Uh, phase one and two customers for the most part uh, have our customers that are on a higher tier um, and they have chosen to go into in, in one of those phases. Uh, and then one other thing I, I'm putting here is uh, some of the platform solutions, bundles, suite apps, um, some of those are not released until uh, a, a few weeks after phase four. So some of those won't, won't come out until, until November-ish uh, this time around. So just to give you an idea of how that works. Um, and so, of course, Sneak Peaks uh, comes, uh, comes out in around right about phase zero. So, and the easiest way to get that, so uh, in your dashboard, you should have this, I think this actually comes up, um, there's a new release portlet, and th this summarizes the new features that are coming out, and we group these into different themes. Um, but what do you want to do if you want more information? So. Uh, at, at the bottom of that portlet, there's uh, links to videos, your release preview account, sneak peeks, etc. There's training resources. Um, we write blogs that are organized by vertical and by theme um, as well. They're trying to give you some context as to how you might use these new features. Um, suite and suite answers, you can go and get uh, the access to the release notes and the, and the training videos that we do. Um, the same around for, for MRP, for example, we actually did three sessions because there's so much in, in there. Um, so that's another place to go and look. And of course, release preview account. The thing with your release preview account is if you don't use it, then you lose it. Um, doesn't mean you can't get it back. Uh, you can just talk to your account manager, but, uh, but basically what happens now is that we look at the, the, the customers who actually used uh, their preview account in the previous time, and then they automatically get one. Uh, if you don't, then we don't generate it for you next time around. Okay, so lots of stuff to cover here. So I'm going to go through these quickly and hopefully we'll have some time for questions towards the end. Um, this is not all of the features. I've picked some by, uh, by industry or by area. So first of all, uh, 
product industries. We, we talked about this last time, uh, I think. So we have actually launched uh, NetSuite MRP, uh, the first phase of it. So, uh, so basically we've completely redesigned the supply side. Um, we've not done anything in terms of the demand side yet, although that's coming up uh, in the future release. Um, and so basically this is able to handle a uh, much higher volume. In fact, there's no limit on the number of, of items or volumes of transactions that this will work with. Um, it has its own pegging uh, engine, a new pegging engine that's uh, it's actually shared with supply allocation. So you can use supply allocation and MRPs together. And uh, everyone who has demand planning uh, gets this automatically. Uh, you have to enable it. Uh, but once you enable it, then you go and you choose the items you want to run this through this new engine. Um, and there's a really nice new planner's workbench that let, that's, that's got all the real action messages and exception messages um, and lets you release plan POs, work orders, transfer orders, um, et cetera as well. So this is basically doing supply planning, it's doing uh, an MPS process, it's doing a DRP process uh, all in one. Uh, it's really fast and uh, responsive, and uh, we're pretty excited for this. Uh, invoice grouping. So we talked about this. So this is not this is not consolidated invoicing. Um, it does still create individual invoices, uh, but it does it then gives you the ability to go into a screen for a particular customer and group invoices together and present one invoice uh, to a customer that they can then pay. And if they pay it, then uh, all is, is automatically dis dispersed to the to the member member invoices. Um, so again, as, as Evan said, this is only this is the first release. Uh, this we know this doesn't meet all use cases, um, but we think it meets enough to get it out there right now. Um, and uh, so one thing to know, I played with this. Um, so once you turn this on, you have to go and basically at the customer level. And you can do this by a CSV update. Uh, there's a checkbox to say that, that customer should, is, uh, should, wants to be, should be included in invoice gripping. And so only invoices created from that point on, from sales orders created from that point, will actually show up for this. Uh, there is a way to go and, and, um, and, and get existing invoices eligible. Uh, but again, that would some, require some kind of update. So uh, enable it, um, and, then, and then any invoices from that point forward should be available for gripping. Uh, this is pretty exciting. So we've had the quality management uh, app for a few years now, um, but it was focused primarily on doing inspections on receipt. Um, and so now it's actually going to let you do, uh, do uh, pre-delivery or pre-shipment inspections. So you can now have customer specific inspection profiles. So if a customer wants certain things tested in different ways, uh, location specific inspections, etc. So It's basically a lot of the same functionality just being triggered um, on uh, on the shipping status, so whether it's going, it's, it's, it's a picked, packed, or shipped status, uh, you can choose exactly when to go and perform this. It just expands expands the use case for the quality management app. Uh, this has been a big request. So uh, the WMS app that we have rebuilt a few years ago, and that we relaunched the mobile app just two releases ago, I think it was, uh, is now able to be used in a location without bins. Uh, this was a big request that came from uh, smaller warehouse locations and uh, retail stores, etc. Uh, and so there's a few things, other things we're looking at doing with this. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, but that uh, has definitely been a, a top request from uh, retail and retail in industries and some smaller businesses warehouses. Okay. Uh, On to the services side. Um, so there are some new notifications for project managers uh, that will alert them to different issues with projects that they're responsible for. Um, and so there's, whether those projects are missing actual time, uh, whether there's time to be approved, expenses to approve, that sort of thing. Uh, they'll just try and give the uh, project manager more uh, ability to manage their projects by exceptions. So if you have lots of projects going on or, or some large projects going on, this should be quite useful. There's also uh, uh, project budget templates and uh, revenue calculations. So we added the work breakdown structure and so we really, uh, a few releases ago, um, and really enhanced uh, that. You'll see a lot of the new features we're bringing out are improving existing features. 
uh, and uh, there's a lot of, of effort in, in improving the, uh, the user interface um, and the workflow for users as well. Um, and so it's just, it will make it a lot easier to go and, uh, and uh, create your budgets and, and make sure that you have uh, everything accounted for. Um, so there's Oracle has this content and experience, so basically a document management um, uh, solution. And uh, so there is now a sweet app that will give you access, access to that. Uh, I think this, this is something you have to pay for, um, but it integrates it tightly into, into, into NetSuite. Um, it's been, uh, right now I think it's, it's, it's been tightly it's focused on the projects side, but we're gonna expand that into other areas and a lot of custom uh, integrations as well. We actually all use the Oracle uh, content experience cloud for uh, for our own document sharing now, and they've made a lot of strides recently with how that works. Um, so keep a look out for that. For customers in the uh, nonprofit space, uh, some has, there's been some improvements around uh, fund accounting. So the first, uh, I think this is the first the first release on on self balancing segments, um, and uh, and and so again, I think there's some future. Uh, uh, Functionalities come, up, come in this area, but basically the order balances uh, account entries um, across multiple dimensions. Uh, and then on there's you can now do payroll allocations. Uh, that's also part of uh, of fund accounting as well. Um, so it's tied into certain additions uh, and allows uh, nonprofit organisations to allocate their their payroll costs across multiple different programs, projects, grants, etc. As well. Global financials. So there's always uh, lots of things to do here. Again, a lot of this stuff is uh, is actually automating some tasks that were already possible. Um, this is a new one though. So this there's now the, the ability to go and auto create uh, your uh, transactions based on the on your bank import. Um, and so basically, you go it allows you to go and create rules, um, and then based on those rules, you do your bank import, it will automatically go and create whatever transaction type you tell it to. Uh, Intercompany cross charge automation. So again, this is something you could do before, but it was manual. There's now a new cross charge workbench um, that will go and show you all of the transactions that you have to go and create, and then go and create them for you in the back in, in the background. Uh, another intercompany AR AP netting. Uh, you notice the, the new screen design here. All of the new features that we have, we have a very, very large uh, user experience team that do extensive research with and, and, uh, and interviews with customers uh, about uh, new features and finding out how they want how they want to work, not how they're currently working. Um, and what that results in is we get you know, very specific UI elements for, to, for different solutions. And in this case, they wanted to be able to go and see the, um, the, the, the payable uh, receivable side by side. Uh, and so you can go and you can, it makes it easier to go and, and uh, identify where there might be issues. Another thing that happens with that, though, is once we design those uh, UI elements, they go into a library, um, and then other teams can use those. So you'll start to see that same design in other in other other screens. Uh, cross subsidiary receipt again. This is something that was was possible before, but this basically automatically creates the uh, cross charge in the background between the between the different subsidiaries. Uh, and then as the, the vendor prepayment process, which was introduced a little while ago, is now being uh, made part of the uh, these uh, suite approvals. And also there is uh, Amex credit card integration for your expense reports. This is uh, uh, pretty exciting. This this was also in the in the services part. I just left it in the in the financials one, but of course for anyone who's working on projects. Uh, and they have the, the issue uh, Amex cards uh, for, for, for uh, recording expenses, uh, then this will make that process a lot easier. And tied into that, that goes in, and you can go and um, establish policies uh, and that will policy will, will uh, can, you can set up per diem, et cetera, and it will flag whenever transactions might be out of, out of that out of policy. And then there's an approval process with that too. Okay, Street People, lots of things going on with Street People. Uh, there is an all new performance management module. 
Um, and so basically what this does is it lets you go and uh, manage that whole process within, within NetSuite. So first of all, the user would go and set up your goals. You can actually tie goals to metrics. So for example, you, if you were in sales, you could actually have a goal saying uh, that I'm going to hit 100% a quota or 110% quota. Um, and so you can actually tie your, uh, your goals to, to actual metrics within NetSuite. You can build your own metrics uh, based on with some safe searches. So we're wor working on building some libraries of, uh, of, of metrics that we think might be useful, but you can go, also go and create your own. Uh, when it gets to the view time, then this enables an online view process. You can go, the, the, the employees can do a self-review, the manager can approve it, then they get together and, uh, and discuss it afterwards. So uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, there's also some new uh, uh, direct deposits. Uh, so uh, employees can go in and, uh, and, and figure out exactly which account they want to go and have their be paid into. Um, and also uh, any variable pay, so bonuses, commissions, et cetera. Uh, you'll also see that on the employee timeline as well now too. Uh, and also there's uh, ch employee change requests. So uh, you, can, uh, you can have interchange requests for promotions, transfers, uh, pay increases, that, that sort of thing. And there's workflow, workflow templates to help you with that too. Last but not least, on the platform side, there's a, I love this feature. This is a, the Sweet App Marketplace. So right within your NetSuite account now, there's a Sweet App tab if you have access to it. Um, you can uh, automatically install some of these bundles, depending on some, some of the ones that we're releasing that are free. Uh, you can actually install right from within that. But you also get to see all your partner apps as well um, and, uh, and request information uh, so you can see uh, exactly what, what it might do. Um, we've made improvements to the application performance man management. So there's a new dashboard that, sh that shows the overall health of your account and it flags different things, different areas you might want to go and look at. Um, and there's also one then that's looking at concurrency. So, so this will map your integrations and identify when you might have be having some, some issues uh, with that too. And this is kind of cool. So there's a new, we always had a record browser, but that was really restricted to only native records. Uh, there's a records catalog now that will automatically include your own custom records in your account too. So that makes it a little bit easier uh, to go and see what's going on with your, with your own data set. And this one, I'm quite excited about this actually. So Oracle has, uh, this is very confusing because they have OCI, which is Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. They also have OIC, which is Oracle Integration Cloud. Um, and so this is basically their own integration uh, platform. Um, we built out now a native Salesforce integration. Um, we're working on a number of others that I can't talk about right now, um, but uh, you can expect to see, uh, this is very competitively priced, um, and you can expect to see some uh, other integrations in the, near, in the near future to pretty common uh, applications. So um, you can probably guess what some of those might be. I couldn't possibly comment on it at this, <laughs> at this time. Wow, we got that through that pretty quickly. So let's see if there's any questions in here. Did, did you see any questions coming up at all? Let's see. Uh, I'm not seeing anything in the q and I think uh, we, We'll give the audience a little time to absorb that. And Gavin, you're sticking around with us, right? I'm going to stick around, yeah. All I'll right, so we'll have the Q&A session uh, at the end. Um, all right, so let's get back into the presentation here. Everybody seeing the correct screen this time? Not my, my uh, yes. screen? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and I'm going to launch a poll now. So uh, we're talking about our Q4 meeting. Um, are you tired of webinars? Because I certainly am. Um, and we're, we're going to try to change things up. It's, it's still going to be virtual, um, but we want a chance to interact. So instead of doing the Zoom webinar where all the participants' cameras are turned off, we're thinking about doing a Zoom meeting um, and we want some ideas from you. So uh, I'm going to launch a poll now. Would, would you prefer the Q4 NetSuite user groups be split up by geography or industry. Um, so our goal is to make these a little smaller, a little more like our traditional networking events in our hometowns. Um, and 
we're thinking, you know, we could just split it up by, you know, NorCal meets with NorCal and SoCal meets with SoCal, or we could split it up by industry. Um, let's say everybody in, you know, manufacturing uh, meets together and we keep it, you know, nationwide. Uh, the other question we have for you is, do we want some educational content or do we just want to make this, uh, you know, kind of like a networking event um, where we're talking to each other and, and striking up conversations and maybe some side conversations on chat. Let's talk about that and, um, you know, let us know through the poll. Uh, we're going to try to tailor this to you guys. I know we all long to see each other again and, and the in-person events are something we miss. So maybe if we all get on camera with each other and um, uh, make it a little bit more personal for Q4, um, that will be great. All right. Um, I have to Palti up next, right? Awesome. Thank you uh, very much, Craig and Michelle. Thank you. Thanks for All joining York. us. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, really uh, enjoyed uh, the presentation so far. Uh, I'm Brandon White. I am an account manager with the Palti. I uh, focus on our NetSuite partner community. Um, and I'm excited to be here today and share a little bit about Topalti and, and what we do. Um, Topalti is a global accounts payable platform. Uh, what we really aim to do is free finance departments from AP challenges and really kind of create this autonomous, self-driving AP world for finance teams. Uh, we recognize that, you know, now more than ever, you know, finance leaders are really kind of required to step up and guide their organizations to sustainable success. Uh, you know, CFOs at modern high velocity companies have a critical role really in navigating this uh, challenging time. So they come out the other end, you know, stronger, and they're also setting themselves up for longer term business success as well. Um, so they're really expected to go, you know, far beyond uh, traditional accounting responsibilities right now. Um, adding in a lot of strategic initiatives, you know, things like CAC analysis, fundraising strategies, scale and agility improvements, but they're doing this all while balancing the short-term needs of day-to-day -day finance teams. And that's, you know, we see that as a huge challenge. Uh, you know, so why is Topalti critical to those businesses and those finance teams? Uh, manual finance operations hold the finance team back. Uh, accounts payable is the number one most time-consuming finance function for many organizations. Uh, you know, again, we recognize automation as an essential element to modernize finance so these teams can really focus on their businesses' success. And we see that as, you know, four major proof points. There's three up here, but I'll, I'll talk through all of them. You know, number one, maximizing efficiency. Uh, Topalti is reducing 80% of uh, the accounts payable workloads uh, for many uh, companies. Um, this is also an opportunity to reduce, you know, future AP headcount. Again, stay lean, stay agile. Uh, stream, we also have help streamline global operations. Uh, so handling cross-border payments or intercompany transfers uh, for any uh, entities uh, outside the U.S., for example. Um, accelerate, you know, business vis visibility. Uh, we have a number of case studies that show where we are uh, acceler accelerating the month end close by 25%. And we're also giving timely visibility into AP spend. We're setting up smart financial and cost controls, um, avoid non-compliance with solutions for tax, um, setting up audit-proof AP best practices. We have role-based permissions, uh, so we can really kind of lock down who gets to do what uh, with Interpolti. Um, and then we can jump over to the next slide and I'll tell you a little bit about what the solution looks like. Um, in our view, AP automation starts with supplier management, onboarding your new suppliers, vendors, payees, uh, we uh, have a white labeled service that really pushes this onto uh, the suppliers that are signing up. At this point, we do have a bi-directional sync with NetSuite. So what's changed in NetSuite has changed into Pulte and vice versa. This is also where we partner with KPMG to, uh, to fill out those tax forms, W-9s, and we're collecting that uh, data as well. Um, so the suppliers in the system, now they submit an invoice where we're using OCR to extract the data from those invoices. Uh, we're using machine learning and AI to set up a advanced approvals routing for those invoices as well. What's unique about Topalti is that we are a licensed money transmitter. So um, that we are, you know, licensed, uh, we're certified and regulated much like a bank. And that's what enables us to, uh, you know, pay in 120 different currencies. We're using six different payment methods uh, as a LMT status. We're also doing OFAC screenings 
uh, to any of the payments that are being made to make sure you're not paying anyone that might be on the sanctions list. Um, and finally, again, with our integration to NetSuite, uh, we reconcile and report all that back into the ERP. Um, and we also do offer you know, 1099 and 1042 uh, prep reports as well to streamline that, that process too. Um, so that's a little bit about Topalti. I will be hanging uh, out here in the meeting for the end for the Q&A sessions. I uh, look forward to hearing from some of you. Uh, also, please feel free to reach out to me directly if I can be of assistance. Awesome, Brandon, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with our user group today. Um, and thanks for being a sponsor. Absolutely, um, thank you, Greg. You know, Brandon, I really miss uh, swag. I know Topalti always had some good good giveaways. You know, Avalara, Build, everybody always had some good giveaways, right? When, when do you mm -hmm. think we're gonna get back to that? I, I want, uh, I want one of those little screen protectors for my video, uh, my video camera again. Uh, yeah, I'm running out of pens around here. I don't know. Well, I'll make a note right now, Craig, and we'll make that happen. I was also <laughs> excited to hear Evan's whispers of Sweet World re returning uh, in the hopefully not too distant future. So, uh, yeah, lots I, more think, opportunity. I think we're talking virtual for for now, and and then we're gonna you know really look forward to getting back and seeing everybody and. Uh, in person again. I, I don't know if we're going to be shaking hands and hugging anymore, but we'll see. We'll see what the new normal is, right? Absolutely. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. We, uh, we're moments away uh, from uh, talking to Mr. Jay Scott. Uh, Jay Scott is the founder of Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. I'm going to give our user group a reminder. Uh, we're going to check the leaderboard again after our, our conversation with Jay. So uh, now's the time. Um, uh, donate now. Go on over to that page um, that we've got a link to in the chat um, and uh, uh, support a great cause. Um, Jay is is up next. Uh, we're going to introduce him in just a minute. Uh, but I want to take a moment to say that I'm really excited about the next two sessions that we have because they're both led by NetSuite users, right? A lot of times you're seeing NetSuite professionals working with partners, people from you know NetSuite corporate, um, that we're the ones giving the presentations. Uh, but again, as we like to reiterate often, this this user group is about you and the way that you use NetSuite in your day to day. It's about the people uh, who are on the scene, not the people behind the scenes. So uh, anytime that we get uh, volunteers, that we get users to step up and present. Um, to uh, talk about how NetSuite has affected them and their business uh, and sharing that with the group is phenomenal. So I love to have educational sessions. Um, I also just like to talk to users about their experience. Um, and that is what we're gonna do uh, right now. Um, so uh, we're, we're running a little behind, but uh, Jay, thanks for sticking around. Are, are you with us, Jay Scott? Uh, Co-executive director of Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. I'm here. All Thanks right. Thanks for having hey, me. I am gonna do a little administrative stuff here. I'm gonna turn off the screen share. I'm gonna turn on my video. I'm at like my shirt. my virtual lemonade stand here, and I'm sporting some uh, swag. We were just talking about swag. Uh, I'm sporting some Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation uh, T-shirt right now. I love um, it. So uh, this is uh, a session, a little fireside chat between the two of us, and, and we're going to talk um, about your experience with NetSuite. Um, it's a real pleasure, um, and thanks for taking the time today, Jay. I, I know you're a busy guy. Can you, um, can you start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your organization? Well, my name is Jay Scott, and I am co-executive director of Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. We're a charity that has a funny name and an interesting beginning, um, but we're making a difference in the world for kids with cancer. And so Alex's Lemonade was actually started by my daughter when she had cancer and she came up with this crazy idea that she was gonna set up a lemonade stand in our front yard, raise money, give it to the doctors so that they could help kids like she had been helped. She was on a clinical trial that really changed her life. And um, you know, as parents, we thought it was it was a cute idea, but we kind of teased her that she was going to raise five or ten dollars, but she said she wanted to do it anyway, so we let her do it. And um, she raised uh, over two thousand dollars at her first lemonade stand, and 
from there, she decided she wanted to keep doing lemonade stands each year. Her second lemonade stand, she raised 12,000. Third lemonade stand at poor grain, and she raised 18,000. And you know, she died when she was eight. She started doing this when she was four, but before she died, she had raised over a million dollars with her lemonade stands. And then other people started doing lemonade stands and sending the money to her to help her. So with, with other people's help, she raised a million dollars before she died. Tremendously inspiring story. Thank you. Uh, the tenacity of kids, right? Yeah. Um, so you kept the flame alive and, and you said to yourself, I, I need to keep this tradition moving forward. And, and you set about creating the foundation. Um, you know, what did that look like organizing around this idea and turning it into uh, an organization really? So, you know, it was an interesting uh, decision-making for, for my wife and I, you know, it would have been easier for us if we, if we just moved on, we have three other boys and, 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 um, and help them. But we realized, or my wife realized really that we had a chance to help a lot of other families and other kids if we continued what Alex started. And what she really started was a movement, a movement of people. You know, we, after she died, we heard from so many people that said, you have to keep this going. Mm -hmm. And it was people who were supporters. It was people who had a, their, their own kids with cancer. And so we did, we decided to, to keep it going. And if you fast forward to today, you know, we're one of the largest childhood cancer charities in the world and funding research to try to find better treatments for kids with cancer. And then we have service, like a lot of people wouldn't realize this, but if your kid is diagnosed with cancer, you don't get the same treatment everywhere in this country. It depends where you live. Um, the treatment options you have, especially if you have a kid with a relapsed cancer. And so families have to make the decision, are they going to travel? And it's even more difficult now during COVID-19, but are they going to travel across the country to get a treatment that might save their child's life? And a lot of families can't afford that. And so one of our biggest services that we provide is if there's a treatment that could save a child's life and the family can't afford to get there, we will get them to the hospital that has this treatment to try to save the child's life. Well, I, it's, you know, also growing from an idea where you're donating money to an idea where you are leading the charge and providing services. Um, as an organization, you've grown in diversity, you've grown in need, you've grown in cost and expenses. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that running a foundation is akin to running a business. You've got operating costs, you've got expenses, payroll, personnel, you know, there's corporate giving. There's all sorts of things going on. At what point did you realize that you needed technology as your partner to manage what was going on and kind of leading into what did your journey to NetSuite, finding NetSuite look like? So we realized pretty early on that we wanted to make technology part of what, what we did because it, it helps you scale. And so, you know, us going from Alex having one lemonade stand in our front yard to thousands and thousands of people having lemonade stands in their front yards or in their businesses or um, at their stores or on our school, zoom chat on the zoom chat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back then. Um, or at their school, how do you manage all that? And so technology was the answer. So we, we invested in a web, our website early on to sort of manage these things to give people a, a page on our website, like you guys are using so that they could raise money virtually. Um, and, you know, so someone who might have a stand in their front yard and maybe 10 people come, they can send it out to 20 friends. And so you've gone from having 10 potential customers to 30 potential customers. And so that's how we really um, viewed a, a way to, to, to scale things. And, you know, so if we've raised about $250 million now, you know, from that one lemonade stand up to 250 million, we wouldn't have been able to do that without technology. And so as we were growing our technology, we were trying to figure out what are the best ways to manage um, our donors, you know, because we, we have about 400,000 people that have donated directly to us. That doesn't include people that go to the lemonade stand and drop in a few dollars. Um, and we were, we were struggling with the first couple of softwares that we had. And then, so we were looking for a new software and, and somebody mentioned NetSuite to us. And so, you know, during the, uh, the process, we talked to NetSuite, we talked to a number of other companies, but we thought NetSuite was, um, was a choice for us because it 
one of the real things that we liked about it is it, it enabled us to customize it because we do things in a unique way. And so we've built tools where NetSuite talks to our website and our website talks to NetSuite. So if somebody makes a donation on our website, it gets into NetSuite. Um, NetSuite talks to our email program, which is HubSpot. Uh, NetSuite talks to our online gift shop. We have a very active gift shop that sells things like the t-shirt that you're wearing. And, and, um, and NetSuite talks to Shopify, um, which is what we use. And so it, it really cuts out a lot of work for us to have NetSuite being able to talk to all these different programs that we're using. It's, it's less things that we have to do manually. Yeah, I find the, the open nature and the open APIs, the ability to connect with any SaaS and find the right solution. You know, it may, may have a little bit of a development cost to it. It may, you know, there might be a solution out on the marketplace, but that's the future is the interconnectivity of all of these solutions so that they all talk to each other. And, and I think, you know, going from like a legacy, you know, on-site or on-prem platform into this cloud environment, now, now you have kind of limitless potential, right? Yeah, I mean, you could grow. You can grow in ways that you couldn't grow before, and and you can cut out a lot of labor, and you could spend that spend that energy and spend that labor uh, contributing to your company or your in our case to our mission. So rather than people doing things manually, they can they can work towards the mission. Yeah, automation is that that uh, uh, you know it's on the horizon. You know, it, it's starting. I think to permeate and there's financial automation there's market you mentioned hubspot marketing automation um you know there's uh, uh process automation fulfillment automation there's so many pieces of the puzzle i think the more we go down that road right and rely on the the machines and the ai to do the repetitive administrative clerical stuff that is just monotonous right it frees up our people to be more creative to you know, fill their job roles with the time spent on, on doing things to move the mission forward and uh, saving labor costs so that as a foundation like yourself, you're, you're, you know, maximizing the charitable donations and not spending a lot on administration. I, I totally align with what you're saying. And I, I think the community here does too. So it's great to uh, kind of focus in on some of these topics and say, hey, th this is this is really important to our overall success here as as a foundation is that we're cutting the wheat from the chaff, we're uh, streamlining, and uh, we're, we're really focused on our goals, right? Yeah, I think it's important. You, and like you said, you pay a little bit more up front to get these processes automated, but then you have that automation there for months, for years. And, and, I, I, and I think it's better, for, um, it's better for quality control, and, and really it's better for, to, keep, to keep your employees engaged. So you don't burn them out if they're doing the same thing hundreds and hundreds of times it can burn people out speaking of burnout um i think we're all kind of adjusting to a new normal thanks to the covid pandemic um what have you and the team at alsf changed about your day-to-day -day activities um in light of the pandemic and, and how has NetSuite enabled continuity and your ability to maintain your connection with your donors and things of that nature Oh, wow. We've changed so much because we, historically we've been so event driven, whether it's the foundation planning events, whether it's our supporters setting up events like Lemonade Stands and things like that. So we've had to really pivot like everyone else and, and go to the virtual world. Um, so we've done virtual events. We're just coming off the, the end of our biggest, um, one of our biggest events of the year is called Lemonade Days where thousands and thousands of people um, do lemonade stands all over. And so we didn't want to encourage people to do in-person lemonade stands. So we encouraged them to do virtual lemonade stands. The interesting thing was we had less people do it this year because the people that participate in lemonade days, they usually like the act of doing something physical. Um, and I don't mean physical, like physical exertion, but setting up that lemonade stand with their family or with their company. And so less people did it this year, but they were raising a lot more money mm. uh, on average, which was interesting. So the ones that did it rate, raised more money. And, and going into the last weekend, we were up 
in the online donations for that particular campaign, which I thought was interesting. We all we also another another thing that we do a lot is um, we do culinary events because chefs are big supporters of of Alex's lemonade, and um, and we converted that to our first virtual event where the chefs prepared food and and we shipped it to people's houses. And then we did a Zoom and talked about the food and talked about the cause and the chefs got on and said a few words. Um, so that was really interesting. And we were very nervous because usually when you do an event, you know, you can prepare for the event and it's in your control. But once we put those, um, the food into the boxes on ice <laughs> and gave them to UPS, it was out of our control. Sure. And, and so we shipped out 300 meals and all 300 got there, wow. which was amazing. And such a big relief, you know, I was on the computer tracking um, every single one of them <laughs> to see if they got there. <laughs> and, you know, there was a couple that were delayed. There was a couple that were delayed, but we gave ourselves a one day buffer and they all got there. And so um, the, uh, the, virtual, the virtual version of ourselves has added another level of stress because sometimes you have to rely on other people to do things you would have done yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you, you, it sounds like, as an organization at least, you're finding creative and fun ways to keep it fresh. I mean, there's a lot of fatigue going on right now, and I think a lot of people are just ready ready for things to be normal again. But you know, we've we've got concerns all over the country in different hotspots, and we've all got to look out for each other. So, I, I thank you, you know, as an organizer of events myself, of trying to, you know keep it fresh and keep it new and, and keep people engaged. And I, I think we've got to keep sharing those ideas with each other and uh, uh, support interestingly, each other. Interestingly, um, the people who participated in this event, they got on early, they stayed late. Mm -hmm. um, we only lost one person for the whole, the whole time. Only one person dropped off and they wanted to stay. They wanted to talk afterwards because people have been doing Zooms for work, but this was personal and they were enjoying it. And some people hadn't been out of their houses. So this was sort of their way to have a glimpse and some companionship with other people. And then with NetSuite, um, as far as the foundation goes in the virtual world, it has been really great for our staff because it's much easier for us to use NetSuite than it was our last program. And so people are using it. They're using it a lot and, you know, they have a contact with a with a donor you know they update it real time on NetSuite and then other people who might look into that record can see it can see it and we're just finding that staff is using it and updating it a lot more um, because they enjoy using it it's uh, it's intuitive awesome so um, I, I know we're running a little late we, we got to move on I could talk to you for hours Jay I think you know we just have fun talking to each other but uh, let me ask you a couple of other things real quick so um, I know we came together today with a challenge to our NetSuite user group to raise twelve thousand dollars for Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation and uh, all Michelle and I got were these t-shirts right um, I don't know exactly where we were at before we started the conversation. I think we were 20% of the way to our goal. Um, I'm really hoping that this conversation sparks people to get on uh, the website and go over there, uh, make a donation today. But I did want to ask you, um, so we make a donation. How, how does that money get spent? What, what, is, uh, what are the NetSuite users contributing to today? So the bulk, of our, the bulk of our donations go to research, which is looking for new treatments. So childhood cancer takes the lives of more kids in the United States than any other disease. And a lot of people don't realize that until you know someone who gets childhood cancer. And so we're researching uh, for new treatments and better treatments. Because another interesting thing about childhood cancer is the kids that survive it, 70% um, of them, about 70% have a lifelong side effect from the treatment not from the cancer, but from the treatment, because the treatments that we have historically treated kids with cancer with have given them brain damage, eye damage, hearing damage, heart damage, kidney damage. And so we're looking for treatments where we can save the kids' lives and not give them these lifelong side effects from the treatment itself. So that's what we do with the bulk of our money is we fund research looking for new treatments. And we've made a lot of progress um, looking at um, treatments that uh, our immunotherapies where it boosts the immune system of the kids so that they can fight off the disease themselves um, and not have to give them as much or any chemotherapy. That's the, that's what we're really going for. Excellent. Um, all right. 
we're uh, we're going to wrap up. We're going to get you back into your day. You've got a lot of important things to do for the foundation. We sincerely appreciate your time, and we're going to keep our user group moving forward. Uh, a final question for you, Jay. Um, can you give your fellow NetSuite users any advice on uh, overcoming challenges and, and tragedy um, to make lemonade when life gives you, gives you lemons? I think the key is, you know, try to make the world a better place, a little bit better each day than it was the day before. If you can just do something positive, keep moving forward, baby steps, you can get over just about any, any tragedy. But it's, you know, it's not going to all happen at once. You just have to do it a little bit at a time. And if you do a little bit at, at a time, in the end, you've done a lot. Awesome. Um, Jay, you are a power NetSuite user. Um, you're an evangelist for the platform. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today um, as a user. Um, unfortunately, I don't think you can stick around for the Q&A at the end. Um, but, um, you know, we're going to encourage everybody to uh, donate. And if you have questions, you can send them through Michelle and myself. Uh, or here's the greatest idea. Type your question on our donation page with your donation uh, in the comment section. And uh, we'll make sure that Mr. Scott sees your question and uh i'm gonna i'm gonna just guarantee for you that that you'll answer I, whatever you can i definitely will and i'm gonna go make my own donation on your page too i just clicked awesome. on it awesome so, thank you i appreciate it all right thanks so much i'm gonna go back into the screen share with our donation message i hope everybody's seeing screen number two uh again i had a little problem where i was showing my preview screen today um, but there is our link, alexslemonade.org. It's in the chat. Please go click on it. Um, for every dollar that you donate today, uh, Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation will get two. Uh, thanks to your sponsors from uh, the New York, the SoCal, and the NorCal NetSuite user groups. All right. Jay, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Us. Appreciate it. Have a great it. day. You too. All right. I'm going to stop my video here. And that was Jay. Um, next up, we've got DSI. Uh, can everybody see my, my screen? Just want to make sure. I can. Thank you, Craig, for the introduction. This is Vicky. Oh, your volume's a little low there. Can you turn it up a little bit? Can you hear me now? Am I better? Still very faint. Very faint. Uh, headphones? Uh, better? Much better. Now we got okay. you. Okay. So uh, thank you, Craig, for the introduction. This is Vicki Holmes with DSI. Um, first, I want to say I really enjoyed hearing about Alex's lemonade stand. Um, I, just like Michelle, um, heard about this organization for the first time at Sweet World. So great job to Jay and his family. And obviously, we all hope there's a cure for childhood cancer very soon. So um, with that, I want to tell everybody a little bit about DSI. So DSI is founded 41 years ago. Uh, we actually are a global supply chain team that provides expertise to deliver um, to the business challenges of tracking inventory. So really DSI um, was established around on-premise um, customers and clients, um, but we are rapidly assisting our 3,000 plus clients to transition to the cloud especially with solutions like NetSuite. So we really, really enjoyed our um, relationship with NetSuite. As you can see, DSI was named NetSuite's SDN Partner of the Year in 2019. So um, our alignment with NetSuite as we go to market together has been a, a great relationship um, and we continue to look forward to working with NetSuite. So with that, Craig, if I can have the next time. Okay, so, um, so DSI's cloud inventory solutions um, provide real-time end-to-end um, inventory visibility. I think if you click one more time, you should have, um, perfect, perfect. So, so that means that we're tracking inventory inside the four walls and we're tracking inventory outside the four walls. So whether it's the, where, the warehouse, the distribution center, or it's actually tracking the inventory from the warehouse to the trucks, to the remote pop-up warehouses, um, virtual warehouses, wherever it might be, we can track that inventory all the way to the end consumer. So um, from a DSI perspective, when we work with NetSuite, we step in and help NetSuite with all kinds of features, like whether it's license plating and FIFO or cartonization with wave picking, uh, field services, route sales, any of the mobile apps that are in the field. Um, there's lots of things that we can step in and work with NetSuite to provide one source of truth. So, but what I want to talk about today was kind of the hot item or the current largest supply chain need we have. 
And we've put out some press releases and shared some information regarding this, but there is a huge need due to COVID to provide contactless or touchless applications to optimize inventory. So what we're trying to do is provide uh, workers with tools and solutions to be productive and safe um, while they're reducing the person-to-person -person contact. So um, we have solutions like proof of delivery where on mobile apps, um, Workers can capture their GPS coordinates, they can capture photos, um, they can um, gain remote approvals. So anytime that they're delivering items, um, they don't have to have that one-on-one um, -on -one contact, they can do it via the mobile apps. All that information is captured, pushed back up into NetSuite so you have that real-time information. So again, it provides you the traceability and accurate information uh, at any point in time during the delivery process. And I feel like every other phone call I'm answering is regarding um, our driver check-in, check-out solutions, the electronic um, bill of lading. So what DSI has done, and we've done this um, for years, but we um, are uh, pushing to the market really how we've digitized really a paper-based process, the bill of lading. So uh, when the truck drivers are coming in with full loads of inventory, uh, we have facilitated different processes, whether it's with mobile apps, it's iPads, it's kiosks, enable those folks to not have to have that one-on-one -on -one contact with the warehouse workers. They can capture the information, put it against their record inside of NetSuite, and then there's real-time information that you can capture. So whether it's you know um, things you need to kick off to the back office, which we know most of the back office workers, they're not in the back office. They're at their home office or you know some other location. But you can kick off that if the items are shorted, there's damage items, maybe they've crossed the threshold for um, continued discounts for, vo for uh, volume discounts. But all that information is real time captured inside a NetSuite with our um, contactless enabling solutions. So kind of like Evan said, businesses are adapting. There's not one size that fits all. So we're really looking to help our customers find digital solutions to increase safety, productivity, and, and visibility to inventory. So if there's any takeaway, you take away what DSI does, it's tracking inventory inside the four walls and outside the four walls to give you real time um, accurate inventory inside of NetSuite. So with that, Craig, that's it. Excellent. Thanks so much, Vicki. I know, you know, at BSP, we've worked with DSI a lot over the years. Most of our manufacturing and uh, distribution clients uh, integrate uh, with DSI. And, uh, you know, thanks for, for telling the user group about it. Um, Appreciate yep, your enjoyed time. Work with, enjoyed work with you all. Yeah, and Jay Scott's tough to act to follow too. So thanks, you know, for <laughs> for coming on with. Me. Yeah. Sorry for sorry for the bad slot there. You know, after a very emotional and wonderful yeah. presentation, but I think you did a great job. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> all right, um, I have to pause the user group for a minute, um, and uh, shout out Michelle, uh, my co-host, and your user group administrator um, for all your user service to the NorCal SoCal, SoCal and New York NetSuite user groups. Uh, we have a sad announcement. Michelle uh, will be leaving uh, at the end of August and she's moving on to pursue her career in special education. So Michelle, uh, normally we'd have cake, maybe some, some flowers or something, but I, I made you a slide. Um, from my heart uh, to show you how much all of the users that you've uh, gathered over the years and all of the vendors and uh, everybody uh, thank you from all of us to you for all of your efforts to make this possible. Um, and I'll also shamelessly take a minute here to say Michelle does a lot for the user group. So we are looking for volunteers and we're looking for people who will never take her place but can possibly help uh, fill some of her shoes. Um, so if you have um, uh, some time and quarterly would like to help the user group in some of our administrative uh, registration uh, promotion uh, efforts, um, Michelle wears a lot of those hats and uh, she's moving on. So we, we wish her the best. Uh, you there, Michelle? Yeah, thanks, Craig, and thanks, everyone. It's been a pleasure going to all these events with you and building the events from about five people to now we have over 500 to six across, six across, 600 members across New York and California. I'll still be able to join the meetings, and I hope you all continue to come and volunteer because we'd love for all of you to participate and keep the heart of the user groups the same. 
Oh, thanks again, Michelle. Um, again, you will be missed, but we all appreciate the efforts that you've made to help, you know, found the user group, create the user group, and support it all of these years. So you're awesome, and we'll miss you. All right. Um, another tough act to follow, Robert, uh, saying goodbye to Michelle, but I think you're up to the job. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bob Weiner from Starbucks, Inc. in California. Um, Bob is the CEO uh, of a family-owned uh, business, and he's going to talk to us today about uh, using NetSuite remotely in the cloud, um, you know, both now during COVID-19 and uh, beyond. But I, I, I think you'll also hear that he's been uh, a proponent of the cloud for a long time, haven't you, Bob? Yes. Um, it's, uh, I never thought I would actually have to use all the tools that I was kind of building in the background over a couple of years of just being kind of a, a geek about technology. But um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's all hit, hitting on all cylinders right now. <laughs> Awesome. Well, for our second user presentation today, uh, really, really excited to have you here. Um, and I'll remind all of your peers, uh, if you want to step up and be like Bob and, uh, and talk to your, your peers in the user group, um, that's what really adds value to us, is us sharing our stories with each other. So uh, thanks so much, uh, Robert, for your efforts. And uh, I'm going to pass it over to you and you can uh, share your screen and your presentation. Thank you. Nice palm tree. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. Let's start. Uh, first of all, thanks to Michelle and BSB for setting up such an informative day. Uh, obviously, with some great speakers, and I've been taking a lot of notes myself, so um, I'm always learning. And uh, so, thank you for that. Uh, my name is Robert, and my presentation today is "Jump into the Cloud in 2020." Uh, I'm the SoCal NetSuite user group president, and that means that first I'm a big fan of NetSuite, and I just like to spread the word and uh, things that I can help someone else uh, that I do, then um, I'm all about it. So I'm going to be speaking on how to use NetSuite remotely, um, but since NetSuite by itself is remote software and already in the cloud, I'm also going to be explaining the process of getting to working remote, uh, what my company did. So that when we were all forced to work from home, we were surprisingly ready to go. Um, because people like to know, here is an outline of my presentation. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about me and my, Net, uh, my NetSuite experience. Next, I'll be talking about my journey installing NetSuite in 2017 and some of the decisions that I had to make during that process. And then pulling from previous experience, I will be providing tips on installing not just not just NetSuite, but really any business software or system. And then I know that everyone's 2020 is not exactly as they, as they planned, and we're definitely no exception. And so I'll share where we are as a company and kind of what is working well and how we're uh, managing working remote. And then to wrap up, I'll give some lessons learned, and three takeaways just in case you were multitasking during the long program today. So I graduated from USC in 2004 and officially joined the company in 2005 to help grow and expand sales. Um, never had really business experience or background before that. So it, it was really interesting jumping into the family business and kind of getting so many things thrown at me at one time. Um, our company distributes packaging for perishable goods, ranging from fresh seafood to frozen ice cream. We make a lot of direct-to-consumer home delivery kits these days. Um, because those definitely have gone crazy in this COVID world. Everything uh, is being shipped to home, and uh, it's, it's amazing what people think that they can put in a box and have it show up on your doorstep cold, ready to eat, all those things. Uh, in 2008, our accountant left, and I knew that at that time, I needed to learn more about business and accounting, and our, at the time also, our legacy business software was no longer supported, so I started taking some basic accounting classes and installed QuickBooks in 2009. Yeah, at, at the time, it was a nice upgrade for us, 
uh, that experience actually put me on the path to going to business school and uh, getting my MBA in 2014. Uh, then in 2017, our QuickBooks database crashed, which was a pretty terrible experience. I don't recommend it for anybody. Uh, but then I did some research and I found NetSuite and with the help of business solution partners, actually successfully installed NetSuite. And today I'm still the network admin for NetSuite and we have 13 seat licenses. Um, we are an essential business and we take our responsibility very seriously. Uh, we have a duty to operate at a high level to support our customers and really the greater food supply. And we are currently operating at full capacity due to NetSuite and happily comply with all CDC and local guidelines requiring social distancing, hand washing, face masks. So we've been pretty fortunate during this, uh, this pandemic. Um, but before 2020, uh, never could I imagine having to operate remotely, uh, but here we are. So my company in 2017, we had 10 people in the office and 10 in the warehouse, and we have about $10 million in sales. Uh, we use two company files, two QuickBooks company files, and we need them to be o both open at the same time. Fortunately, QuickBooks Enterprise allowed us to do that, so we didn't have to log in and log out, which, which is pretty time consuming, but um, that was one benefit of having the enterprise. Uh, we had Windows Server 2008, um, which added some remote options to our, our company. We had remote desktop but we still had a server on site. We had IT, um, had to do upgrades. All the computers need to be networked. So um, that wasn't ideal. And then we had some Salesforce, Exchange, QuickBooks integration, but it was definitely not a cloud experience and it was, it was kind of clunky. So uh, pain points, well, everybody has them. Uh, we have lots of them, but here are some of the bigger ones at that time. Uh, we had a 10 user license with QuickBooks and it was super slow. Uh, it was never getting better. We'd get new software, or sorry, new hardware, and it, it didn't matter. Um, Windows 2008, um, the end of life was just in January of 2020. Um, so we eventually needed to find something in 2017. And so, uh, I also felt that we were kind of too reliant on one company uh, at the time into it, did our merchant services, payroll, um, but they're a legacy software company. They're built for the desktop. Uh, they're super slow to react to the cloud. And at, at back then it definitely was not a smooth transition. Um, not sure what, what they're doing now. Um, but then in, like I mentioned, uh, March, 2017, our QuickBooks database crashed. Um, QuickBooks support uh, paid for the top level support and their final word was just make a new company file. Uh, that was unacceptable. Um, why even keep our data being digital if we have to just start over every number of years? So that was really the red line for me that I needed to make a change. So in researching the ERP software, uh, I was excited that I learned I could add some new features to our digital suite. I found that uh, some software would work, some wouldn't, but um, the must haves uh, first was having the two company files open at one time. I mentioned that before. Uh, that eliminated about two thirds of the companies that I was looking at. They don't always offer that. Um, but next, definitely tired of running on a slow system. Uh, I'd always call somebody over the phone and they're like, oh, my system's so slow, hold on, blah, blah, blah. I, I hate that. Um, so I was actually really looking for a fast system, whatever that meant, but um, I, that was definitely one of the must-haves. And then in 2017, there were a lot of new ERP and accounting software companies popping up. Uh, so a lot of new choices, uh, a lot of net companies. Um, and so um, got to see a lot of new ideas. And my brain was, was really turning with this. Uh, but the last thing is I wanted to make sure that I picked a company that was going to be around for a long time and something that was built for the cloud. So made a standard list of pros and cons. Uh, these are just mine, um, but this was kind of how we looked at it. And so for NetSuite, the pros, yeah, fast, 
scalable, customizable, check. Uh, being platform agnostic is, is pretty nifty. Uh, I love Chromebooks. Um, I love that they're fast, they're cheap, they're easy. Uh, you can swap them in and out. And um, one of the things that I don't think people mention so much when they're looking at NetSuite is the hardware savings. Um, it's not always calculated or it's hard to, to imagine, uh, but it's definitely real. Um, so next was one world, two company files, one time check. That's awesome. And uh, last you can see, I put Oracle on both lists because at the time didn't really know if they're going to continue to love NetSuite or not. But uh, um, now I would definitely say it's on the pro side. Uh, the cons, well, most things today, quote, must be online. It was a little scary at the time making the jump. And uh, my IT CPA advisor actually advised against it. They said that it's better to have all your data in the office so someone can steal it, physically steal it, or, you know, the, the opposite of the cloud. Um, so it's true that next is it's true that NetSuite is not as graphical compared to other desktop software. It's not a big deal. It's just it's just different. It's worth noting. Um, I found the net the data import feature was very clunky. Uh, we had to actually create a lot of records by hand, which was kind of annoying. But you know, just going through the different things. And uh, the actually the the number one con. Uh, was a NetSuite implementation team. Uh, to me, uh, their program was really out of touch with what my company needed and actually almost blew the whole deal. Uh, even with the zero to cloud in 100 days program, to me, the process was really slow. It was super expensive and not designed for my company. But the uh, surprise ending, uh, I went forward with NetSuite. So here are a few things I found successful uh, when rolling out any software or business program. Uh, first is MVP, uh, minimum viable product. Make the framework first, and then you can make it pretty. Figure out what, what is the bare minimum that I need to launch a product, to launch a program, to, to just try something. Uh, for us, it was sales orders, items, and customers. That's it. I needed to make an order. I needed an item to sell, and I needed someone to sell it to. Everything else I didn't care about, because uh, you can build from there. Um, we didn't need all the forms to look pretty on the first day. Actually, most of the historical data can actually be entered later. Um, but it, it was better to spend the time getting proficient at the workflows than spend the time making sure that the product is perfect on the day of launch because any launch is going to have bugs and problems so you don't need to build the tower to just have it fall down on the first day and now three years on you know i'm still tinkering with netsuite and customizing and moving my forms around uh and so obviously is netsuite itself uh they make their own updates two times per year so they're still tinkering with the software uh next uh don't just copy your old system Design your new system on NetSuite strengths. Uh, maybe learn something new or try a new workflow for your company. Because all ERPs really try to do the same thing. It's order to cash. So before you script everything or move everything around, see how NetSuite does it. And see maybe you can learn something how someone else is doing it. Uh, this one, this next one's a big one for me. Accept that things will be different. I, I really actually like to smile every time something changes when we were doing the implementation because I knew that thousands of other NetSuite users had to make the same sacrifices when they implemented. So you, to embrace the change. Um, and the next one, I, I think this is also key, is find your internal implementers. They're going to be your biggest cheerleaders. They're going to help when IT is not there or the boss isn't there or they can't fix something. They're going to turn to their coworker or email their coworker, and they'll, they'll get an answer probably faster, but then they're also going to push you through the challenges to get you through the other side. They're, they're so important. And lastly, commit, dive in, don't go backwards. Technology doesn't stand still, and it definitely doesn't go backwards, and your company really shouldn't either. So. 2020 really has changed the way that my company does work. I never expected to have almost all of my office working from home. And 
while the warehouse can't move pallets or drive trucks remotely, we are able to limit the staff and physical contact in the warehouse. Our picking ticket reports are all auto-generated. Truck dispatch is routed through NetSuite. And we operate 100% paperless out of the Northern California location, which is pretty cool. And um, NetSuite is a big part of that puzzle. Um, but they're not the only piece. So to be remote, you need to get everything on board. So email, uh, Google Suite. We use the cloud-based email, um, but it's a lot more than just documents. Um, I, I love Google Sheets, presentation, uh, spreadsheet, uh, notepad. I mean, you don't have to pay for Microsoft Office anymore if you don't want to. It's all collaborative. It's all in the cloud. It, it's all right there. And it's auto save. It's, the Google Suite is, is worth it. It's still, totally worth it. Uh, for file sharing, we use Dropbox. Uh, there's other programs, Box and, and whatnot, but for file sharing, collaboration, scanning documents with your phone, uh, it's amazing. You can access every single company file on any device at any time. Um, you don't need a local file server anymore. That costs money. You don't need that. Um, and it's so refreshing that if a computer goes down or someone loses a laptop or whatever, no sweat. Just grab another Chromebook. 150 bucks later, that person is back up and running at 100% in minutes. It's, it's great. And then the last piece we added is Slack. Uh, Slack, if you don't know, is uh, internal uh, company communication. So we have no more internal company emails clogging our inbox. And we have no more lost email chains. So these email chains get longer and longer and longer. And uh, you go to the search, you can't find it, doesn't matter. It's all in Slack and the inboxes are all clean. All the communication is crisp, it's concise, it's right there. And we actually find that I get faster responses. And I give faster responses. And it's actually faster than text messages. It pops up on my phone, it pops up on my iPad, on my computer. And, and so whatever is closest to me, I can answer right away. Um, but kind of one additional insight that I had when doing this presentation was why Slack is better or any chat-based communication is Slacking, as they call it, promotes less formalities when you're communicating. So instead of typing, dear boss, hope you're having a great three-day weekend, sorry to bother you, uh, through chat, you just basically say, hey, and you get into it. So that's more time for real work substance and getting things done. And that's actually progress. That's, that's technology, not just recreating what you're doing before, but it's actually making it better. Uh, so where does this leave us? Well, we have everything in the cloud. We have everything that's fast. Uh, I can self-service add or subtract users as needed. Well, with the exception of NetSuite, I can add or subtract users as needed. Uh, I hope they fix that. And lastly, we can work from anywhere. Uh, one time I thought that meant that I could work from Tahiti, which is where I took this picture. Um, but now that means all my coworkers can work from Tahiti too. <laughs> so what are the lessons learned? Uh, first, maybe I should have installed NetSuite in 2009. Uh, eh, we, were, we were probably weren't ready then. Um, definitely should, have, should not have installed Suite Success. Uh, I felt like I was oversold with that upgrade, but Again, that's just, these are my lessons. Um, but a lot went well. And the biggest thing was really starting with the MVP and, and building from there. We were able to implement in less than 45 days and really have never looked back. And um, I, I love it. Um, some of the biggest learning experiences. Uh, well, the four deep dives into each of my business units was really exciting. I was able to see and experience the bottlenecks that my coworkers were fighting through. We would look at what is AP doing on a case-by-case uh, -case basis and see how together we can find to, uh, software to open up these bottlenecks. And then lastly, never stop growing. So I really encourage people to look at the new release notes like we heard earlier today and see what applies to their business. I wrote my own notes um, on the new release and um, figure out how you can implement them, how it can make your software better.
Um, sometimes they're kind of boring, but there are definitely some key new features that are that are interesting. And besides, you're all paying for the upgrades, so you might as well take advantage. So to wrap up, um, if you had to multitask during the presentation, here's where you should pay attention. Uh, here are the three takeaways that I would write down. Uh, first, I would embrace the change. Those whose heads are stuck in the sand are always going to be passed up. 2020 really, really highlights this point. Restaurants are, that are not able to pivot to have a good takeout system probably aren't going to survive. Think about how that applies to your business and what 2020 pivot are you not seeing and not embracing. Number two, you have to find your tech savvy people and let them help you. Uh, kind of put in another way, these NetSuite user groups, we are NetSuite's tech savvy people. Most of us here just aren't on NetSuite payroll, but we give NetSuite feedback. We help less efficient people and companies succeed, and we are all better for this effort. So ask yourself, how can your tech-savvy coworkers help solve problems for your software challenges, or implement your software, or help you move to remote? And then lastly, never stop growing. Things change. Being a part of these user groups is a great way to learn new tips and tricks, but don't stop there. New cloud software is coming out all the time. Be open for this change and don't be hesitant to jump in the clouds. Plus, it's paradise here in Tahiti. So thank you for following along to the end. I'm happy to answer any questions now or later if you wanna reach out directly. And uh, my contact info is on the slide. Thank you. I think we just want to come visit Tahiti. That's. <laughs> <clears throat> hey, Robert, thanks again. Um, as always, uh, as the president of the SoCal uh, user group and uh, as a user and as a supporter of the platform, we all thank you. And, um, you know, let's get some more people involved. Uh, let's identify some great SoCal users to give a presentation next time around. How about that? Definitely. Looking awesome. forward to it. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. And when I do, the first thing you're going to see is we're a little far away from our goal. Um, we have raised, though, an incredible $1,481. Um, uh, we're, we're pretty far away from the goal of our 6000 but I have some faith in all of our users. Um, and I also wanted to say that you know, we announced earlier a one for one challenge grant. Um, so for every dollar that you donate to Alex's Lemonade Stand, Stay, Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, um, your user groups were going to donate one dollar. Um, you know what we realized? We realized that there are three user groups here today. Um, so right now I'm announcing a three for one match. What does that mean? That means we're only $519 away from raising a whole bunch of money uh, for uh, the foundation. Um, so if you donate 519 more dollars, um, the user groups are gonna kick in $6,000 and we'll have a total of $8,000 raised uh, for the foundation with your help. Thank you so much. All right, moving forward, uh, it's now my opportunity to do a commercial for Business Solution Partners. Um, so uh, we are one of your sponsors uh, of the event and uh, I happen to work for BSP uh, and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about us now. So Business Solution Partners uh, is moving business forward with the tech stack designed for growth. We are a NetSuite Oracle, Oracle NetSuite five-star award winner in 2019 and 2020. Uh, we've been working on the platform uh, since almost since the inception. Uh, we've been with, the, with the, the solution for a very long time as a partner, I think 17 years. Uh, over that time, we've come to specialize in uh, implementations, integrations, custom development, training, and support. Uh, and we've expanded our horizons to include Workday Adaptive Planning and HubSpot. Uh, these are three best-in-class platforms with one solution provider for the strategies for your success. Um, we're really happy to work with you uh, in whatever capacity you need, um, uh, whether it's financial automation, marketing automation, uh, or business transformation through the Oracle ERP platform. Uh, 
Uh, as I said, we are five-star partners. We have locations all across the country. Um, uh, we started out in New York originally, uh, expanded to the West Coast in California. Now we have four California locations, uh, Santa Barbara, um, San Jose, uh, LA, and uh, San Francisco, uh, as well as locations in Florida and Texas, um, uh, Montana, uh, Chicago, uh, we are, we are kind of all over the map now. Um, so we have grown significantly as a company and we've grown in support of NetSuite. Um, so we like to say that we enable companies uh, to leverage the NetSuite platform to the best of their abilities, streamline operations, um, integrate with the best in class software uh, on the marketplace today, um, and even customize the platform. Um, so if you need any of these services, uh, training and support included, uh, get in touch with us and we'll, uh, we'll be able to let you know what we've got to offer. All right, that's our BSP commercial. And now it's time to introduce uh, another partner from the West Coast, uh, Nolan Business Solutions, and their uh, representative, Adam Porter, who's a CPA. Uh, Adam, did you take our, uh, our our CPE credit course earlier? Did you get your certificate? I, I hope, uh, I actually, I, I was not able to, but I do need uh, my CPE, that's for sure. Well, unfortunately, you can't get the certificate for view in the recorded version. Uh, sorry you had to join us late. We wish we could have sent one of those off to you. Uh, everybody no needs worries. those CPE certs. But thanks so much for joining us today to talk about Sweet Analytics. And it uh, looks like we've got a great presentation. Thank you. All, All right, right, so I'm going to pass the baton over to Mr. Porter. And you can get screen control. I'll stop my share. Adam, it looks like we got you. All right, fantastic. Well, thanks for everybody for still sticking around late in the afternoon. I appreciate it. Um, being at the end, I hope to not bore you and hopefully be able to keep your attention, attention as I go through. So I said, I'm, I'm, my name's Adam. I'm a software consultant at Nolan Business Solutions and just a kind of a background of Nolan. Um, we have been a NetSuite partner since 2006. We're based in Boulder with corporate headquarters in the UK. And we are NetSuite solution provider um, and part of the um, a member of the NetSuite Commerce Agency program. Um, we do develop NetSuite bundles or applications. Two of our main ones are electronic payments and advanced bank reconcili reconciliation. We did develop a fixed asset management, which was acquired back in 2011 by NetSuite. So if you like fixed assets, you're welcome. If you don't like parts about it, I'm sure that was NetSuite, not us. No, just kidding. Uh, they're great. Um, and then we also do NetSuite consulting. So in the healthcare space, professional services, assistant project management, and other advisory services as well. Uh, just a quick recap of kind of our, our two main bundles. We have the advanced bank reconciliation, which really brings a user-friendly interface to the recon reconciliation process. And when you think of it, there's, there's a few steps for the reconciliation. One is you know, auto matching things, matching things that are both on the bank and the NetSuite side. We, we have rules, we have logic, complex logic that can go around and generate that with tolerances. Next is the one time or the, the bank side only thing. Sometimes you may have a direct debit that may not be within your NetSuite instance yet. So we do have templates that allow to auto generate those transactions within your NetSuite instance based on the bank statement. And then finally, there's those one time things that you true up. And so with the Nolan solution, you're, you are actually able to automate all of those steps, including the bank importation. Um, if we kind of just look at the next slide of, you know, from the far left of bringing in those transactions through the bank statement uh, and the transactions from NetSuite, matching them, auto posting, reoccurring, and then creating those one time. Uh, all but those one time are actually able to be automated through our process, which definitely eases the the burden of reconciling an account to just going in and seeing any of the open items um, after majority of all of it has already been matched. And then the second one is our electronic payments. Uh, this is an electronic payments module where we generate the bank file relating to ACH, wires, virtual cards, checks, uh, any of the bank payment processing that um, you're used to. There is a bill payment approval module with it. And one of our, our touts with it is that we have a highly flexible um, file format module. So we're able to support multiple subsidiaries, currencies. Um, we currently are assisting our clients in payments 
in dozens of countries, dozens of currencies, cross country, um, not just you know things domestically, but you know international payments as well. And we you know work with over a dozen different banks, and each bank, you know, when you get into the electronic payment space, each bank always has their own format. And with our solution, we can really accommodate and customize to exactly the format that you and your bank need. And again, kind of a brief overview of kind of what that bank process is. And with the Nolan piece, we actually live wholly within your NetSuite instance. So there is no um, fear of any data leaking outside of NetSuite. It all lives within the NetSuite environment. You process, you generate, the file is generated and saved within your file cabinet there. And then through an integration partner can be also automatically loaded to the bank. So definitely eases a lot of that. But with kind of that introduction out of the way, uh, the agenda today, you know, we'll briefly kind of talk, what is Suite Analytics overall? How do we enable it? What permissions, pros and cons? Look at what data sets are, workbooks, go through a demo, and then we'll recap at the end. So first, what is NetSuite Analytics? Well, really it consists of several different pieces of reporting and analytical tools that NetSuite provides. Namely, as you see here, work workbooks, safe searches, reports, KPIs, dashboards, and Suite Analytics Connect. Um, I imagine most of you probably have utilized a lot of these, if um, at least some of them. I know safe searches, uh, when I was uh, in industry working, safe searches were a big focus of mine uh, to be able to pull out useful data from NetSuite and to be able to uh, provide kind of the data solution that my team and, and the management team needed. Uh, workbooks is, is kind of the new kit on the block. And that's one reason why I wanted to highlight it today because it definitely does enhance and bring a lot of the analytical tools in NetSuite up to par to a lot of the other tools that you see out there with whether it be Power BI, Tableau, or other tools as well. And so first, to, to enable analytics, the good news is it's actually enabled in all accounts already. So if you look under your enable features, analytics, it should be checked already. Uh, all standard roles do have access to it, except for some of the limited center roles. So like a customer center, vendor center, employee center, partner center, kind of those centers that do have a very limited scope of NetSuite. So your, your users will already have access to it. And so when we and we move and look at permissions, there is a Suite Analytics workbook permission that does have to have the edit to be able to allow creation, modification of, dead, of data sets and workbooks. Other than that, all your native uh, permissions do still stand. So if, if you're an AP and you have access to bills, you'll have access to bills within workbooks. If you don't, then you won't be able to see that information as well. So it does rely on all the native permissions within NetSuite to uh, allow what view, viewing individuals would have. There is a new permission, which is the analytics administrator permission. And this essentially allows someone to sit as the administrator across all analytics, data sets and workbooks. So they can, you know, as it says there, delete, share, edit those workbooks. Um, otherwise the workbooks and data sets you will see will be either those that you have created or that have been shared to you. So why, why would you want to use workbooks, especially if maybe you're already comfortable with using safe searches, comfortable in reports, you know, that's kind of, you know, that's, that's where your comfort zone is. Why, why go out to, to workbooks and data sets? And I think one of the big pieces is that consistent data set, that single source of truth. If, we, if you look at a lot of the BI solutions out there, they segregate a lot of the data that you want to consume and then the analysis of that data. Um, up until now, they've been more or less joined together within NetSuite. A safe search in, in essence is your criteria, is your data set, and then you put your analysis on top of it as well. And so it, it wraps both into one. And the challenge is multiple people could query the same thing within, within NetSuite and maybe come up with two different answers or two different numbers. So this allows one common data set that multiple different analyses can be based off of. And it also allows multi-level multi joins. Um, so if you're used to dealing in safe searches, you know, if you're looking at a transaction, you can, that transaction, you can look at the bill. The bill has a related, essentially, record to that, to the vendor. And so you can look at the vendor, but you only can go a single level join in your transactions or any of the safe searches that you're dealing with. And so this really allows more flexibility of how you 
bring your data across different record types together within NetSuite. Another benefit is it provides more real-time analysis. A lot, of, a lot of the things that you can do now within a workbook and using data sets, you may have been doing offline through Excel or through other mediums to be able to aggregate you know, and consume this data. And so this allows more flexibility within NetSuite to build those reporting and analyses so that you're not having to pull out, refresh, send it back out to everybody, but you can have real-time data at the click of a mouse. Like other suite analytics, it does support custom fields and any customization that you put, and it does provide visualizations through the workbooks in the, in the form of pivots, charts, and tables. Cons, data sets can be difficult and complex. Uh, I'll be honest, when I first started looking at using data sets and workbooks, it is a bit of relearning and retooling. Uh, I was very familiar with safe searches. I was comfortable there to be able to pull data to ensure that I wasn't duplicating values or I wasn't duplicating lines and, and that I had a good quality data set, uh, which is uh, still challenging within safe searches. But data sets, I think, especially with multi-level joins, it adds to the complexity, which can be intimidating. And like I said, it is, it is, there is a relearning curve as you approach data sets and workbooks but I'm of the opinion that it's, you know, it is well worth that, that time. So first, when we look at a data set, there's a couple different uh, parts of the screen that I kind of just want to highlight before we go into the demo. The first is the records we see on the far left. So these are all the different record types that exist within NetSuite. This is similar as when you created a safe search, you would be able to say you create a safe search and you would see all the different record types you could create a safe search from. Um, very similar to, to that view and what you see there. Next, we see the fields relating to the record that you chose. So in this example, we're looking at transactions and we'd be looking at all the fields applicable and available to us from the transaction records. Next, along the top, we can apply filters to our data set. So filters can be applied both, and, and we'll get into this, the data set and the workbook level. But these, you know, these are, available for the data set to be able to filter, to be able to you know, keep the data broad enough that it can be used for multiple applications, but at the same time concise enough that you're getting a good quality data set with no redundancies or duplications. And then finally, it also does support formulas. So you can have dynamically calculated information within these data sets so that you can, you can utilize maybe some fields that aren't um, or would not be most practical to put a custom field out on a record. So you can, you can use these formulas to create those dynamic pieces of information. Next, workbooks. As I said, there's three different visualizations. We just kind of see on the, the bottom left, a table. Then we see in the top right, a pivot and charts. And we'll get into those a little bit more as we go through the live demo of that. So with that, I am going to transition out of, out of this and jump into a NetSuite instance. So when we first go to analytics, it should be along the top bar. We can see that we have the two tabs of workbooks and data sets. Um, NetSuite does come with some template data sets and workbooks Oops. outstanding. So you will see there are a lot populated here. We do see that anything that you created will say employee or we can, we can sort all the different templates, I mean the workbooks and data sets based on what's shared with me, employee ones, templates, or all of them. So we're just going to create a new data set. And as I said, this is similar of what you see with a saved search. You can see different record types along the side here. For simplicity's sake, we're just gonna do a simple transaction search on some bills. So if I come down and I find transaction, It will then load that and it'll, similar to the safe searches, there'll be a couple fields that will automatically populate for us. If we do want to add new fields, say we come down and we want to add due date, we can simply drag and drop that across. It'll think and refresh and we can see it'll populate the new data. Um, so we'll just, we'll add a couple extra fields in here that may make sense. We'll add a currency. 
um, as we know we do have things across multiple currencies and let's let's come down especially if we're looking at bills important things may be knowing the status of our bill and the terms so we may want to know you know how how long from when we received the bill is going to be due as you can see right now this is still pulling everything across multiple different uh, different types that we we have bills we have assembly builds and all that so if i scroll back up to the top i can see all my fields that i've added to to my table to the right up here and so i'm going to take type and i'm going to drag it up into my filter and now i can select say hey i only want bills and bill credits let's filter that and we'll see our 19,000 transactions drop down to 710. That, that's a lot more manageable. Um, other things we could do, we, we could drop in a date filter here and say, you know, similar as we see in other uh, NetSuite reporting tools, we do have like relative dates. We have date ranges with a lot of the kind of the smart ranges here. So we could go and say, give me anything after you know, say five years ago and apply that and it will reduce down our population again. But one thing to keep in mind, any filters that we do set on the data set level are automatically part of our workbook. Um, if we think of this in, in a multi-stage approach, this is stage one. So anything that we exclude from here will never be able to be included in our workbook. So in this case, we'll, we'll say for our, our example sake, maybe somebody might wanna look back further than that and it's not a lot of transactions extra, maybe we'll remove that to allow a little bit more flexibility around uh, who could use and consume this data. So if we're happy with our data set and how we've created it so far, we can go and we can click save and we can give this whatever name we want. We'll just bill, bill credit, transaction data set. Uh, it does allow a nice description field which I know with safe searches, sometimes it would be nice to allow a lot more narration around what is the purpose of it and all that. So this does allow a lot more free form to provide more descriptive uh, language around what the data set is, what it is not. Because um, as I said, one of the benefits of this is this data set can actually be the home to multiple workbooks and multiple different analyses on top of it. So being descriptive of saying, hey, you know, this is, only bill credits and you know bills and bill credits. If I had the date within a range, you know, greater than five years, it will provide some a little bit of color around it so that the people that consume it will know uh, what that data set truly entails. If I'm happy with it, I can share my data set. We can see that we can share it between roles and employees. So if there's specific roles that I want to share it with, or just some specific employees you know something for Derek I can share it off to him otherwise I'll save well and, and there's two ways I can I can create a new workbook directly off of this or I'll show the other way we can go and save and close and we'll go back to our analytics home screen and now when I come over to workbooks I'm going to create a new workbook and when you create a new workbook it's going to show all our data sets here for us to choose what data set do we want to build our workbook upon? In this case, we want that bill and bill credit work data set. So as I said before, we do have the three options, a ta table, a pivot, and a chart. We'll start with the table as it's a fairly, fairly simple, I think, to, to, to get it. it is a, in essence, just a table where we can drag across entities. Here we have the entity in, in this one, if we remember, we're looking at bills, was really looking at the vendor on it. And we say, okay, yeah, we can add the vendor across here. Maybe I want to add currency across, status, pulling my amount across there. And we see the table builds out. We can go within each one of these and apply a filter and say, well, maybe I only want to look at things that are looking at in euros list will probably get pretty small. Um, you can always come back and, and clear that oops, clear that filter off. Come here and remove the filter. Um, so one initial way of, of running your analysis is essentially just taking your data set and then refining it down to what we truly want. Um, for example, 
we had that date filter in there previously, we can bring that across. And now we can put that filter back in if, if that's really the scope of what we're looking at today. Um, but in essence, a table is a table. This is you know simply just, if you think of Excel terms, this is dropping it into Excel and then applying our filters along the top of excluding and including certain pieces of information to see a uh, population of, in this case, transactions, bills, and bill credits. The second, if we want to, we'll open up a new one, is a pivot. And I think this is something that feels very home probably to most all of you, is very close to kind of what we're used to seeing within Excel. So first, we'll pull our amount crossed into our measure field. So this is what's going to be populating out over into here. And then let's take it potentially, we'll, we'll take it by type and let's put status. So we notice one thing different with pivots, it doesn't automatically reload. We do have to push the refresh button up here in the corner. So as it reloads, it'll populate and we can kind of see something funny happening over here. As we look of my bills paid and my open bills, I got a couple different lines chunked in there, actually several within my bills paid. And we can see that we have different currencies existing within there. So let's just, let's drop currencies across to see kind of what's going on. Let's refresh that again. And now that makes a little bit more sense when we look at bills paid and we can see all those different currencies. Well, what if we really don't want all those different currencies? We kind of want everything to be able to come together. Well, now um, within, within the measures, the three dots to the side, we can open up and we can see there's some assumptions already being made. One is that the summary type that we're applying to this measure field, this totals is a sum. It may not always be the case. Maybe we do want an average or a count. And say, you know, I'm really just interested on what my volumes are from a numbers account numbers and I can say, oh wow, yeah, I do have a significant amount of bills in the US and not really a lot of credits overall. Uh, but if we change this back to sum, we'll get back to our, our currencies. Oh, and let me refresh. There we go. And, but with this also with currencies, we can do a conversion for those currencies. Uh, as many of you who use safe searches know that it does have a, a currency consolidation function in which it can consolidate the foreign currencies at different rates. So if we come in here to currency options, we see we can convert to and we can pick, pick a particular currency we want to, and then also specific exchange date. So these are looking at a spot rate conversion. So if this is existing in multiple entities, we are just looking at a spot conversion, not necessarily consolidated exchange rate conversion. Uh, we're fine with letting it just anchor to today click apply and then I'll come back up to here and we can see that apply conversion is selected. So now if I go and refresh my pivot again, I will see it's still broken out in all the different currencies because I've included that, but now it all is all in US dollars. So in this case, if I want, I can actually pull the currency back out and refresh my screen. And now I'll have a lot cleaner view of that same data that's now consolidated across all my currencies into just a USD equivalent. Uh, another potential use of looking at a pivot, maybe in this case we were really interested in looking at which vendors we're looking at. So we'll go and we'll drop a uh, vendor in there. Maybe we'll want to throw in types along the top to see what it is and then we'll drop in our measure again. And so now we see our total amounts across them. We probably know that, hey, I do want, um, I do want status to be included. So I can click on status and say, let's filter based off of status and let's put in open bills and undefined credits. And we'll let that be our, our filter on this to filter down to just what is looking to be opened. So we, we can see again here, we do have multiple currencies existing. So if we were to come along, uh, come along here and we can say, okay, let's apply a conversion again, get that all back to a USD amount. Then we can see that if we come down to that GBP vendor, 
it is back to a USD amount. So we can consume that data and look at it um, based on the vendor. In any which way, similar is, is what I, I'm sure you're all accustomed to used to uh, using within Excel. And finally, the last thing that is available is a chart. So a chart, you know, in this case, let's, let's put date along the axis. Let's again, amounts our favorite thing right now. And let's, let's actually just run it and let's just do a count. Maybe we're just wanting to see what is our frequency of these bills coming in or, or bill credits. And so we can see kind of how the data plays out over here. When we did add date, we noticed it did group it by year. If we do want to add more granularity to our, our date timeline here, um, one, we can always drag date in again, or we can click the plus and it'll add the next level down. Or we can come down here and say, I don't want quarter, I want month. We can set it up to month there and we can click refresh. And now it'll show us instead of on an annual basis, it'll show us on a monthly basis. Just to highlight why we need kind of the two levels, if we take out the year, we can see that it actually does aggregate across the years into months. So in this case, this is, this is all years combined that we'd be looking at in this instance. So maybe I'll we'll rearrange these around. We bring our year back, bring it back up to the top. Let's fix our order there. Refresh it. And we have a lot, a lot of gap there. Maybe we do want to run a filter on this. So maybe we don't want all the years. Let's just take, you know, 2011 on. And we can apply that filter and get it down to the population a little, a little bit cleaner data. Um, maybe cut off some of those trailing early years. So overall, that's that's kind of the demo of you know how we can create a data set, and then we can build upon it for whether it be a table, a chart, or a pivot. Another great uh, thing that to point out is oh, similar as as data sets. With workbooks, we can share those as well. First, we would need to save our workbook and then we can share it. So let me let's first save it. We'll just do, call this one test, save it there. And now I can share it out again to roles and employees as needed. But say if I come in here and I realize there's something that I want within my data set that I forgot to add, you can always come back and you can click on your data set and it'll jump you right back to your original data set. So I can come back in and say, oh wait, I actually wanted to bring in something from my vendor record and maybe you know, it's my vendor email because I want to be able to look at them and I want to be able to contact them to, to, to see what, how current my bill is or, or whatever it may be. And so now we can, we can come back into there, we can save it, apply to the workbook, and I come back to my workbook and I have vendor email available. So if I want, I can say, yeah, let's drop that down on my rows. Line it up, refresh it. And now we can see where I have no email and where I do have an email. So there's, there's a, a lot of that flexibility that you're used to with safe searches of saying, well, I don't know what I, sometimes I don't know what I want but I know what I don't want. And based on the data, I can see, oh, well, this is in it, or that is, you know, I need to add this, or I need to modify in different ways. And so this allows a lot of that fluid, fluid nature to the data set in the workbook while still keeping them separate to get the benefits of that. So now if we go back into the presentation, uh, to recap kind of, you know, why, again, the, the sales pitch, why use workbooks and data? and data sets. One, I think the biggest is the single source of truth. Uh, too many times in my past have I ha had two different people pull data which they thought was identical with the NetSuite and had two different conclusions based on that data. This really simplifies it. It, it creates that one source of truth that everybody can point to and say, no, this is, you know, gross margin. Uh, you know, in my, in my past company I worked for, I can't count how many times gross margin was different based on if it was someone from sales or if it was from someone from accounting or marketing, you know, everyone took their own angle at it, right? So this simplifies that. 
and you can once you have a good data source you can continue to to use it so that even though data sources can be intimidating once someone sets up one good data source the workbook is actually very close to what people are used to within excel i think it's a lot more approachable than honestly any other of the suite analytics tool it's easier to use i think than a safe search because it's a drag and drop play and then you get real-time data you're no longer exporting consuming analyzing and then having to re-export each time you need an update but there is that curve and it is limited to the data that you have within NetSuite. So if it's not within NetSuite, we can't consume it. We can't analyze it within uh, Suite, you know, Suite Analytics Workbook and data set. And with that, that is the end of my presentation. I don't know if there is any open. Yeah, Adam, we did have a question uh, from Ann in the Q&A while you were doing your demo. Were you using 2020.2 20, 20 or 2020.1? 20, 20 so in the demo right there was 20, 20.1 uh, so our my demo account has yet to be updated with point uh, 20.2 awesome thanks for that any other questions feel free to um, submit to the q a um, we are actually going to be moving into the full q a session um, so thanks to all the attendees who have stuck it out with us thus far just going to bring up our page <coughs> We've raised over $1,500 uh, for Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. Um, that is going to be matched three for one. Uh, so we are almost at $8,000 raised. Um, and we're really excited to be able to make that donation today. Thank you to Jay Scott. Um, and uh, here's the deal. All right. We're going to keep this open and we're going to challenge you to hit these little buttons right over here. Share this page on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Um, let's see if we can get to that $6,000 goal uh, by opening this up to our networks, our social community. Um, if you enjoyed your time in the user group today and you thought that we brought value to you, um, please go ahead and do that. Um, I'm also launching the closing poll right now. Um, and we are going to now open it up. I'm going to ask all of our presenters and moderators and everybody who is a panelist today to come back on board. And I'm going to start my video. And you guys can start your video and we can unmute. And the Q&A is now open to all of our members today. Um, if you would like to chat with us live uh, at the end of our session today, um, use the raise hand button uh, in the Zoom Q&A and we're going to unmute you and you're going to be able to ask a question live of our panelists. Um, and just to introduce again, we've got a, a real who's who of uh, NetSuite users, partners, um, uh, solution providers, integrators here on our panel. Uh, going down the list, we've got Adam Porter from Nolan. Uh, thank you, Adam, for a great presentation. Uh, we got Cherry Faye Casmarino from the uh, BSP team, solution provider. We still got Gavin Davidson with us from NetSuite. Uh, we've got Hussein Zaidi here, John Mark Esteron, John Schaefer. If you've been coming to these user groups, these should be names you're familiar with. Most of these people have been presenting uh, over the years. Michelle Cronley is still here. I know she's got to run. Uh, thanks for sticking out for the Q&A right at the very end. Uh, Mitchell from Bill.com is still here. Robert Weiner, uh, Weiner, sorry, Robert. Great presentation, and uh, thanks for joining us from Tahiti today. Uh, Tim uh, Chobel uh, is still here. Tom the Miller from Avalara is still here. And Vicky, last but not least, just alphabetically, uh, is still here as well. Um, thank you, everybody, for our sponsors and our... Um, panelist participation. Now, attendees, there's still a bunch of you here, which means makes me think you might still have some questions for our panelists. Uh, if you can find that raise hand button, uh, I will allow you to ask a question. So who's going to be the first intrepid soul uh, to ask your, your favorite NetSuite query or that, uh, you know, that question you've been dying to ask? Crickets. I love it. So, uh, hey panel, how's it going? Uh,
Bob's in Tahiti. Vicki, where are you? What's that? Where are you now? You're on the coast of Florida or? No, this is actually my Cabo office. Oh, your Cabo office. I love it. I love it. I'm in my front yard at my lemonade stand. I like uh, Mitch. Mitch's background is great. Mitch Yee from, uh, from Bill.com uh, makes me think he, he uh, is much, much, much more successful than any of us uh, with that beautiful condo background. <laughs> it's a great illusion to, to make me feel like I'm in a bigger office than really am. <laughs> oh, I thought that was just your living room, you know, your, your mid-century modern living room. All right, attendees, Holy. anybody uh, have questions, have questions? I got something in the chat. Hey, panelist, I loved all the sessions. I found it informative. Thanks for your input. Um, I was wondering if you can upload a saved search and have it converted into a webhook. Ooh. I think Who wants to? The, no, the answer is no. Yeah, the quick okay. answer is you do have to rebuild it, so. Okay, two quick answers, so Gavin, was first to the buzzer on that one in the lightning round. Um, can you go over join in the data set once more? Thanks for today. From Paula in the uh, chat to the panelists, she said, thanks for everything today. Can you go over the join in the data set once more? Um, is that you, Adam? I, yeah, I can feel that one. So with, when, when we are looking at the data set, we see the different record types along that left panel. And so that's really how when we're looking to join and add in the information is looking at what, you know, are we built our data set in our example upon transactions? And then we see the other related records upon that left side. So as you go down and we wanted to join in the entity of the vendor, we scrolled down, we saw that entity vendor listed there. And then once we ex expanded that, we received in the fields of that vendor. It's similar. If you're used to safe searches, it's kind of at the bottom of the list. We have the, you know, the three, three dots after a field to say, okay, I want to go to my vendor fields and expand that and bring those into my safe search. It's very similar in that where we find the related record we want on the left, click on it, and then I'll expand the fields that we can then include into our data set on the right. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for that clarification there. Um, Robert, you had a question. Why no self-service ad seats, right? Oh, Robert, I think you're muted. Yeah, that was my question that I kind of had in my presentation was why are there no self-service ad seats in NetSuite? Why do I have to go and find so many things and have them all un unsynced up? And it's, to me, it's one of those things that is uh, I would feel like I would actually have more seats if that process was, was easier. Um, so anyway. Was yeah, I know we were that. having a conversation about this the other day that um, as SaaS platforms move forward, there seems to be a lot more self-service administration. And maybe traditionally NetSuite hasn't opened up some of that, like being able to add an extra seat, you know, or buy a license uh, right from the back end. Um, Gavin, any any plans to make uh, the sales side a little bit more self-service in the future or what's going on there? Uh, I build, there's lots of things going on that I can't tell you. So. <laughs> you can't tell us about, of course. Um, that, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's the reason we've not done things like that yet is um, there's some work we need to do on the way that the seats are defined, et cetera, um, to make sure that the, user types get access to the right records etc so um there's a, there's limited uh special special user types you know so there's like like the employees that can only, can only access the employee center and, and that sort of thing so um it's just uh we just not got to it but i think with some of the things coming that we're doing now that makes sense that makes sense um and with the new Sweet App store, um, you know, do you think you could put something in there to add a user or something like that that would that would do that? Um, so I'm sure that, I'm sure those things are are being considered. Excellent, excellent. 
We still got a bunch oh, of people on you. board. Oh, here's a question from Anne. Uh, what are the best practices for adding workbook charts to center tabs to deliver analytics to executives while shielding them from having to navigate the analytics workbook interface? So this is about uh, getting those reports out of the analytics interface and into dashboards, I'm assuming. Anybody got some insights on this? Yeah, I mean, if you, sh if you share the workbook, then they should be able to add, they should be able to add it into their, add the portal and add it. I think um, one of the things that you can't do right now um, is like include uh, those portlets in a, like a bundled dashboard sort of thing. Um, so I know that's something that, the, that they've, they've been working on. Because um, this quiz, the Street Success team are, are, have been struggling with things like that as well, right? How they how they deploy. Uh, they're kind of limited in what they can put in dashboards because because not everything can be deployed through, through a bundle. So. Um, I know that that's that's high on the list of of integration things that they're working on. And Anne, if you want any more detail on that, you want to raise your hand. I can um, I can get you live here talking to the team, and uh, we can answer that question more. Or anybody else, if you have a question for any of our panelists, uh, our distinguished group of uh, uh, vacationers and uh, tropical destination and lemonade stand workers, uh, please. Uh, feel free uh, to raise your hand or use that Q&A section. All right, um, as a quick update to everybody, again, we have uh, done really well on our fundraising. Uh, we're gonna leave that fundraising open. Um, uh, I think until we finally deliver our uh, recording and our copy of the deck. So you have maybe one, two weeks left to share those social links on our Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation uh, page and try to help us get to that goal of $6,000 or beyond. You know, anything that we can raise for this organization during this time is great. And um, uh, it was really nice of Jay Scott to take the time out of his day to talk with us and let's see if we can give him some support as well. Um, well, panelists, I think, uh, I think we're off the hook. I mean, thanks for joining us. Thanks for sticking around. I really appreciate everybody. Um, for all those attendees that are still here with us, and we do have a sizable amount of you, um, hey, this is your group. Let's, uh, you know, let's interact more. You, you can tell how bought in everybody is here. We stuck around all the way to the end. We've been here for the whole time to answer your questions. So next time around in Q4 or, or Q1 of 2021, uh, come prepared with a couple of questions. They could be specific to your needs around NetSuite. Um, they could be more general um, or come up with a question about one of the presentations you saw and we're gonna be happy to, to field it. Um, you know, part of it is I just don't wanna let all of you find people go. Um, I like hanging out with you uh, and I appreciate you all being here to support the, uh, the New York, the SoCal and the NorCal NetSuite user groups today. So big round of applause to everybody who participated today. Um, I think that's all she wrote for us. Um, Q4 is, is coming up. We're going to have some type of virtual meeting. We got some great feedback from everybody today on uh, the type of meeting you would like to see. Number one, it's going to be educational. Uh, a rousing 91% of respondents to our polls said, hey, let's get some educational components. We like doing the networking. We like talking to each other, but we love the educational uh, presentations. So we're going to continue with that. And number two, I think we're going to split it up by industry um, so that if you're a manufacturer in California, you could be talking to a manufacturer in New York. Uh, we're going to work out the details on exactly how we do our Q4 meeting, but stay tuned, visit our website, go to our LinkedIn page for the user groups and find out more. And we will be here uh, in Q4 of 2020. Um, and hopefully everybody's going to come back and say how awesome 2020.2 is and give Gavin some, some kudos as we go into 2021.1. And maybe, Gavin, you'll have a preview of that at our next meeting. Sure. Uh, just a quick thing. If anyone wants to email a question because they were too afraid to ask live, then um, just email me. gdavidson at nextweek.com. And um, if I don't know the answer, I'll find out. I'll find someone who does. So. Very good, very good. 
All right, from all of us here at the New York, the SoCal, and the NorCal NetSuite user groups, to our users, to our panelists, to our speakers, and our sponsors, thank you so much. And we will see everybody next time. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Great job. Thank you.